You don't need my permission. Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, friends. I'm Dee Dee West. And I'm Summer. And this is Broken Limelight. We're going to start our episode about the murder of Gianni Versace. So this is going to be at least a two-part episode, and we'll get more we'll get more into Versace's murder in the second part because he was obviously the last one that was killed before the manhunt got real. But this is going to be fun because it's going to be one of those psychological ones where we're going to deep dive into the victimology and his whole MO and everything. Ooh, that's exciting. Yeah, I'm really excited about this because Summer actually didn't know that he was killed by a serial killer. No, I didn't. So I'm excited to get get we're going to get her firsthand reaction here. Also, I you guys hear me talk about Ryan Murphy shows all the time, but he did the American Crime Story, the one that he did also an episode about Monica Lewinsky or I'm sorry, a season about Monica Lewinsky. You know how I love a good <laughs> docudrama. I love my TV shows. But he did like a fascinating show about Gianni Versace. I mean, it's the same show, <laughs> American Crime Story the assassination of Gianni Versace because the way he frames it is that it's kind of like political in nature. And oh. you'll find out that it's because Gianni Versace was openly gay and so was his killer, Andrew Kunan. And that kind of becomes a major theme in this. Oh, that's really interesting. You just wait. <laughs> I'm excited. So another big source for this episode is the book Vulgar Favors by Maureen Orth. So just to give you a little bit of background, Gianni Versace was shot and killed in 1997 out in front of his mansion in Miami by Andrew Cunanan. And it's unclear if Versace had any connection to this man or if there was any motive whatsoever. Interestingly, Maureen Orth, who is a reporter for Vanity Fair, had already been following a string of murders and doing her own independent investigation in, into Andrew Cunanan because he had already married. He had already murdered four people. So she is taking her own personal notes on this guy and digging into him when all of a sudden she gets this phone call. Gianni Versace just got murdered and we think it's your guy. Oh, so she's got this whole like book full of notes on this guy. And meanwhile, the police were doing a terrible job. So they didn't take it serious until Versace was murdered. (laughs) Yeah, basically. (laughs) I mean, we'll get to it, but we'll find out that it, it probably could have been stopped sooner. I'll put yeah. it I'll put it that way before I keep going. I just want to make an announcement earlier this month. I had posted something on Facebook about Carlos Santana. He collapsed at a performance and there were like no updates after that. He just collapsed and he's he's an older gentleman now. So I just I was curious one of these days and I looked it up. It turns out that he's fine now. He just it was a case of like overheating and, and exhaustion. He had been working all day and it's hot as balls right now so he he got treatment and he's fine now he's back to work so i just want to let everybody know he's good thank goodness i don't want to lose him yet you know right not like that yeah (laughs) also i saw that jason momoa was in a head-on collision i really i i literally as i was getting on my computer to get on here like the news article was on there and i was like oh no not my husband when today (laughs) Uh, sorry, when you said head-on collision, for some reason, I'm thinking you're t- telling me the title of a movie. I'm like, okay. <laughs> you're like, never heard of her. <laughs> I know. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's sad. Is he okay? Was that just today? Jason Momoa accident. I'm Googling it. One second. Motorcycle crash video shows aftermath of accident. He was in a head-on collision with a motorcyclist. Ooh, wait, what? Was he in a car? Sorry, it sounds yeah, like Jason so, Momoa is fine. <laughs> yeah, I think he's fine because everybody would be like crying on Facebook. Jason Momoa appeared uninjured after he was involved in a scary head-on collision with a motorcycle this week near Calabasas. That's scary. All right, you ready? We took like a moment of silence there. Oh, yeah. So sorry. There's one more thing I wanted to say about Maureen North, the writer of this book. There are a handful of people that don't think she is a reputable source. And I'll, I'll tell you this, though. They tend to be Woody Allen supporters. Apparently, she wrote a report on him and people are just like lies. So I think they just didn't like the thing she said. And I think that's funny because people Maureen and I have that in common. <laughs> I mean, with that said, I believe she is a reputable reporter. So I'm sorry if you don't. But in this case, I really think she's the, I, I don't think there's anybody better to ask. So just a little bit about Gianni Versace. He was an Italian fashion designer, socialite, and businessman. He was the founder of Versace, an international luxury fashion house that produces accessories, fragrances, makeup, 
home furnishing and clothing. His clothing was known for being like especially sexy and risque. He also designed costumes for theater and films. He was a friend of Eric Clapton's, Princess Diana, Naomi Campbell, Kate Moss, Madonna, Elton John, and Tupac Shakur, and a lot of other celebrities. He was one of the first designers to link fashion to the music world. So like I said, this is a long episode and it's going to dive mostly into Andrew Cunanan in part one. So we will get more into Versace a little bit later. So Andrew Cunanan was born on August 31st, 1969 in National City, California, to his parents, Modesto Pete Dungao Cunanan, who was a Filipino-American, and his mother, Marianne Shalasi, an Italian-American. Marianne was the child of immigrant parents. Her mother died when she was 19, and she moved to California to live with her brother, but she got the feeling that she wasn't welcome there. Apparently, they were, she and her brother were really affectionate for brother and sister, and her brother's wife got, like, uncomfortable by it, so... At that time, she met Pete, who was a Filipino immigrant who was enlisted in the U.S. Navy. As soon as he got to the United States, he says that he came straight from from the Philippines and then joined the Navy. Interesting. I guess. Yeah. He was like handsome and confident and he walked with like a swagger and he had this big booming voice like he demanded attention. So when Marianne saw him for the first time in a bar, her heart just stopped and they spent the whole night dancing. So they got married and they ended up having four children. Their first child was named Christopher. Marianne was six months pregnant when they got married. Then they had a daughter named Elena, who was blonde haired and blue eyed. And Pete instantly suspected that she wasn't his daughter. So Pete ended up developing an attitude of total disgust towards Marianne, and he became super abusive towards her. He was for sure verbally and emotionally abusive. And while he claims that he never got physical, Marianne says that he pulled her by her hair and he did strike her on multiple occasions. He was also a very strict disciplinarian. For example, if the kids were watching TV or like playing in the living room and Pete walked in, like he came in from work, the kids just immediately vacated the room so that he could sit down and eat his dinner alone in front of the TV. Oh, wow. Marianne ended up becoming kind of fragile and dependent. She made sure the house was absolutely spotless per his orders, putting plastic liners on everything. She was also Catholic and strictly religious. It was said that she was kind of eccentric and would often say the first thing that popped into her head in like a childlike voice. At the same time, she was kind of passive aggressive and manipulative. Like, for example, she was known to use sex to get Pete to buy her new furniture. (laughs) And her baby voice. (laughs) You're funny. I need a new couch. (laughs) No, that's not even it. (laughs) That's pretty good. I want a floral print. Money was a huge source of tension between them. Pete seemed to find a lot of importance in social etiquette. He needed to hold a reputation as a classy, cultured, and wealthy man, so he liked to splurge on fancy things, even when he couldn't afford it. But Pete says that Marianne, who was a stay-at-home mom, was actually the one who was spending money like crazy. And she kind of was. like She was taking as much money, because she liked the lifestyle, too, so she was spending all this money on her kids as much as she could. And for reference, Pete had three bank accounts, and Marianne only had access to one of them. Despite their marital troubles, they had two more kids, Regina and Andrew. They purchased their first home in 1967 for $12,500 in a scruffy little town in National City. Andrew was born in 1969, and his birth was really traumatic for Marianne. She lost a lot of blood and fell into a deep postpartum depression, and she wasn't able to take care of herself or the baby, so she ended up getting hospitalized for three months, leaving Pete to take care of the newborn Andrew. Pete bonded a lot with this baby. From the beginning, he knew that the baby was exceptional. Pete says that Andrew never cried. And even one time he stepped on a hot bowl and didn't make a peep. A hot bowl? Coal. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't I, I feel like I know a little bit about Filipino, you know, culture. But <laughs> <laughs> he was here in California. Still, I don't know. Yeah. So he stepped on a hot coal and I guess didn't make a peep. And Pete was like, this child is exceptional. I don't know. To me, that sounds like he's raising a little psychopath. He's like, you're not a pussy. I like it. (laughs) (laughs) Right. He's just like, look at this child. He never cries. I love him. I can do this to him. My wife should be more like him. Ooh, that was bad. (laughs) (laughs) When Andrew was three, Pete retired from the Navy with a full pension and he started pursuing his dream to become a a stockbroker. I mean, his dream was actually to be filthy fucking rich. So he got a bachelor's degree and then a master's degree for business administration. Around this time, Marianne inherited some money and considered using it to start a new life without Pete. But instead, she ended up using it to buy a bigger house with Pete co-signing. 
So they bought a three bedroom house in a nice affluent, affluent neighborhood. That's how you felt. Say it. Affluent. 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 I think so. Affluent. Affluent. I don't know. Affluent. 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 Uh, A nice neighborhood. (laughs) And uh, called La Jolla. And the house cost $96,000. So this was a big step up for the family. Marianne would say that Chris and Elena were from a different, like a different time from Andrew and Gina, saying that they were street kids. Oh. They grew up differently in, in like the scruffy little town, National City. And then like they were all pinching pennies. And then Andrew and Regina were born into this family when Pete was a stockbroker making money, living in this nice neighborhood. And the kids were given everything they wanted while Chris and Elena were not raised that way. Still, the family wasn't rich, but they made sure that Andrew specifically had everything that the rich kids did have. Andrew was known to do really well academically. He read the Bible and memorized the encyclopedia by age 10. He took an IQ test in third grade and scored 147, but his teachers still didn't think he was like spectacularly intelligent or anything. But his parents did, and that was enough. I'm guessing what it was was that Andrew probably just didn't didn't use it in school like he didn't do his work or anything he wasn't an exceptional student maybe right for me what it feels like is maybe he he's good at memorizing facts too that kind of thing makes it seem really smart you know like a savant Mm -hmm. he was a calm quiet kid and he would often retreat into books while the other kids played outside a neighbor from his childhood calls him the epitome of a mama's boy And he recalls that one time he called him outside to play. And when Andrew came to the door, Marianne pulled him inside and was like, you can't do that. So he was like really sheltered. Yeah, that's to not even let him go outside and play. That's pretty sheltered. You're not a street kid. Oh, (laughs) Andrew and his mother had a pretty close relationship, but it was kind of odd. It was like Marianne and Pete were competing for Andrew's attention. Marianne brags that she and Andrew were inseparable when he was a little boy. And this infuriated Pete. He would say, you cannot cling like that to your son. Pete was also noted as saying she suffocated him by his necktie. She clung to his belt loop. It was that kind of relationship, mothering in a different way. Maureen Orth wrote that Marianne was helping create a personality who began to see himself as superior, which his father encouraged. Andrew and Pete's relationship was odd, too, with pet names and using baby talk well into Andrew's teenage years. That's creepy. Yeah. So Andrew was clearly treated superiorly to the other kids. And this kind of cemented the idea in his mind that he was superior. One of his classmates in junior high said, the one impression I got from Andrew back then is he knew something good would happen to him. He knew he would turn out better than his peers, better than everyone around him. This sense of superiority was his defining characteristic. Andrew's father also like trained him to be like this very cultured and eloquent person. It basically just like taught him how to know how to speak to rich people and fit in with them. He would take him out for ice cream and tutor him on labels and image. And he would offer to buy him all kinds of crap. Like he would point out these nice shoes in a blazer and be like, you like this? Let's get you this. Like no matter how expensive it was. And he just wasn't doing that same kind of thing for the other kids. He couldn't afford this. So Andrew learned quickly that his dad would literally buy him anything. It was like having the idea of having to uh, to afford something wasn't a concept to him. They could literally walk around and point to something and it would get bought for him. So if there were financial issues, he just wasn't aware of them. He only knew of instant gratification. Right. And appeared that they had everything that they needed. At least he did. It was like he never even had to conceive of anybody else. Like it wasn't, it didn't make sense. You know, he like snapped his finger and he had things. By the time Andrew was in seventh grade, he had already developed a taste for finer things. He attended a classmate's 12th birthday party and he was disappointed that there was only tap water and no Perrier. (laughs) <laughs> he started telling these grandiose and highly embellished stories, something that he must have also gotten from his father. Pete would often tell these life stories about working for Merrill Lynch in Manila and, and owning a plantation. And just like all these tall tales created to make him seem successful. Hmm. Andrew made friends with a pair of twins named Matthew and Rachel Rifat, I think, who were intelligent and well-traveled. And he would spend a lot of weekends over at their house. He even let them meet his parents, which was something he like never did. He never let people over to his house or like his parents come to the school for any reason. He didn't let anybody see his real life. So then the one time that they did meet his parents, the twins, 
it was like very staged. He greeted his mom by throwing his arms up around her and saying mama and blow her blowing her kisses. And she says that he would brag about how she was better than the other mothers who he called phonies. But nobody who knows Andrew actually believes that because Andrew treated his mom like garbage. He treated her like a little baby. The twins, his mother and said he'd come into the kitchen and talk to me. He treated Marianne like a child, little mother, he would call her. That's so weird, especially because of how close they supposedly were. Maybe she just allowed it to get to that point. Yeah, I'm thinking that his father convinced him like your mother's crazy. You know that. Yeah. Well, she also like talked like a baby. So I don't know. Yeah, but so did him and his father. (laughs) That's with their little pet names and shit. Such a weird dynamic. Super weird. There was another friend of Andrew's from school named Stacy Lopez, who he told about his family. He told her that his mother was a mess and he talked about his siblings being jealous of him. She says that he couldn't bring himself to tell his parents that he was gay, even though he wanted the rest of the world to know it. He was known to love money and love having older men take care of him when he was just 16. She didn't think he prostituted himself, but just like maybe like guys take him out and like make him look good, you know, and like they would buy him presents in exchange. He was a sugar baby. Yeah. From the age of 16. That's crazy. But it's unclear if he was actually having sex with them or not. One time, one of his sugar daddies bought him a bright red leather suit and he flaunted it at school. It was the kind of thing that nobody would dare wear like in that day and age. Like if you were gay, it was like shy, you know? Yeah. He was in your face. (laughs) He also started like introducing this aspect of danger. Like he, he really liked to call attention to himself. He started bringing a gun to school, often keeping it in his car and just like taking it out to show to people. On his senior class ski trip, he was accused of stealing money from a condo where all of his friends were staying. He denied it and nothing was ever proven, but people continued to wonder. He started regularly saying that his two favorite things were sex and taking a shit. His (laughs) gestures and laughter were said to become like edgy. And his friend Matthew said that he would do things a little bit too aggressively, like slap him on the back or grab him in or grab his arm in a way that was like jarring. Mm. Um, This is a little excerpt from the book Vulgar Favors. It is from a psychologist who lived next door to Andrew and befriended him. Her name was Elizabeth Oglesby. She said, narcissists look at people as objects they can consume or use. His parents were just there to serve, adore, or cater to him. It's not unusual, according to psychotherapists who have studied narcissism, that in unhappy families, the mother may choose a son to lavish her attention on and may use him almost as an emotional stand-in for the husband who has rejected her. While their loyalties are torn between their parents, they are taught that they are superior little prince charmings. Yet they are not able to process such feelings of intimacy, so they end up pushing down their confused feelings of guilt, fear, or anger, and eventually what's left is a coldness and an idea that one's image is more important than having feelings at all. The explosion comes later when the child is unable to get his way, then the image crumbles and all the pent-up rage erupts. Yeah, that sounds about right. Doesn't it? That, that's um, also, like the definition of their family. <laughs> yeah, it explains them like perfectly. Also, they actually did call him the little prince. Like his parents would call him the little prince and his brother and sister would be like, well, Andrew's the little prince. Like he got everything. Wow. By high school, Andrew was a full on snob. Pete was working as a stockbroker and he wasn't doing too well. He left one job after two years and then was fired from the next job after about a year. But he continued to blow through his money. He enrolled Andrew in a prestigious school called the Bishop School, and it was not cheap. At the time when Andrew was enrolled, the annual tuition was $4,000 to $6,000. Very few students received financial aid, and the ones that did got about $1,500. So there was still like a huge bill left to pay. And all of this on Pete's occasional income, which never exceeded $50,000 annually, it just, it really put them in trouble because he was also spending on other shit too. Like he wanted Andrew to have everything he wanted. Right. His siblings... His siblings did not get the same opportunity to go to this school. That's so odd to me that people treat their children so differently from one another. I've heard of like, like not that, not to excuse it, but to give it context, like the daughter that he thinks isn't his, like, okay, maybe, but he still has two other kids that he doesn't spoil. And it doesn't make sense to me. Like, I I want, I really wonder what made Andrew so exceptional to him. Right. In school, Andrew liked to dress really formally, like he would wear suits or preppy jackets. He liked to be flashy and get noticed. 
He was known to speak in a loud, boisterous tone, which he probably did as a form of getting people's attention. And he probably got that from his father. He was super fashionable and flamboyant, but he was very careful to keep his family life and his social life separate. So his father to this day denies that Andrew is homosexual. He was popular because his stories were funny and colorful, and he liked to talk about fashion and celebrity. So he was popular with the girls. And sometimes his stories were clearly bullshit, but they were so like fun and entertaining to listen to that people would just like stick around and laugh at him, not at him, like with him. Right. Some of his classmates recalled that he was fun to watch, kind of like a disaster you can't look away from. In the yearbook, he was named most likely to be remembered, which is exactly what he wanted. He never really had any ambitions just to be known for his personality and who he was rather than doing anything. (laughs) Huh. So he had like no actual goals. He just wanted to be seen and heard. Exactly. That was his his goal. He upheld this rich boy act that was so extra. Like one time he made his mom bring him lobster to school so he could eat it for lunch. And he told her that it had to be there right on time. And it was. Which tells me that Andrew was beginning to adopt a disturbing attitude towards his mother from Pete. One of Andrew's classmates said that he finally stopped being friends with Andrew because he became obnoxious and materialistic and constantly put people down. I picture him like a mean girl. Yeah, literally. Actually, it's funny because I went to school with a guy who was like just a really flamboyant, mean gay guy. (laughs) So by now, Andrew's keeping a lot of secrets. He's trying to create the illusion that his life is perfect. But the reality was that he was hiding his sexuality at home, dealing with a dysfunctional family with an abusive father and an unstable mother. And he's got a lot of elaborate lies to keep up with. But his sense of superiority kept growing. Despite their financial problems, Marianne and Pete mortgaged their home and rented it out in order to buy a new house that was $190,000. It had four bedrooms and Marianne called it a mansion. Andrew was given the master bedroom. Marianne slept in the maid's room and Pete slept on the couch. Andrew was also given his own credit card, which he tapped out quickly. By the time Andrew graduated high school, Pete was cycling through a series of jobs and reportedly shady deals to combat his growing debt. He was accused of embezzling money from his clients at his last job, including a 90-year-old woman, and he was cleaning everybody out. Essentially, he was selling non-existent stocks and pocketing the money. Oh, shit. Do we know that he if he was abusive towards Andrew still or just everyone else? That's something that I I constantly wonder about. Or even this is just me, maybe even sexual or something. Right. You know, some kind of weird favoritism towards him. And like maybe you'll get the same vibe later when you learn about like Andrew and what he's like sexually, because that's kind of what made me wonder about him. So. Pete's job started to notice what he was doing and they got suspicious and the police got involved and Pete fled. He literally abandoned the family and he went to the Philippines and then he sold their house that they were living in out from under them. Oh my God. Yeah. His wife and his four kids. That's insane. He's like, well, it was great. Bye. (laughs) For real. And they had no idea what was going on. He had no idea that he didn't have money. So Marianne was left with nothing. She had like $700 to her name. And the only income she had was a $650 pension check from Heat's Navy pension. He also got mad at her for keeping the money for her and the kids to survive, saying that it was actually meant for Andrew's education. Oh, okay. Marianne's mental health was deteriorating and she was regularly threatening to commit suicide. So her two older kids, Christopher and Elena, ended up dropping out of school to go take care of her college they were in college oh wow afterwards andrew flew to the philippines and tracked down his father where he found him living in squalor this experience shattered andrew his father raised him to believe that status was everything and now his father was living with nothing and left them with nothing so andrew's self-worth which was directly tied to his status was completely obliterated andrew had a friend named liz cody and she offered to let him live with her and her fiance in berkeley which was basically right next door to the most liberated gay community in America called the Castro District in San Francisco. Andrew spent most of his time here in gay bars, but interestingly, he wasn't exactly out of the closet with Liz and his fiance, Phil, for some reason, because he wanted the whole world to know he was gay and flamboyant, except his parents. And for some reason, Liz and Phil. I don't know why. So he kept his dating life private from them, too. Hmm. 
I wonder if they just had like vocal opinion about gay people that made him uncomfortable or like scared to come out. Who knows? When Andrew would go out to the clubs and meet people, he would make up these elaborate stories about himself. He claimed that his parents lived on Fifth Avenue and that he had been married and had a daughter. And he actually had a picture of Liz and her daughter, and he would show it to people and say, this is my ex-wife and my daughter. He also said that his wife was a Jewish princess. He used numerous aliases, like he went by Andrew De Silva the most. He also pretended to be Jewish himself. Super weird. He would say things like, we have to celebrate Hanukkah. And like one time his friend pulled out a hundred dollar bill to pay a bartender and Andrew snatched it out of his hand and was like, this is my Hanukkah present. Oh, <laughs> oh my goodness. The entitlement, you know? Right, exactly. So here's where Versace ties in just a little bit. In October 1990, Versace came to San Francisco with his partner, Antonio D'Amico, to see the opera Capriccio, for which Versace had designed the costumes. The two of them were openly gay, and they enjoyed frequenting these gay bars and hanging out in the gay community. And the whole town was like a buzz when they heard that he was coming to town. So they hit up a disco called Colossus, and Andrew happened to be there that same night. Possibly because like Andrew's full of shit and some people attest that he was there, that they saw him there and everything. And they had a conversation with him while others like Versace's family was like, there is no proof that they actually met. Right. Exactly. So the story goes like this. Andrew had a friend named Eli who was given passes to the Colossus VIP room and he invited Andrew. Andrew claimed that he had been to Italy a bunch of times and that he had actually met Versace before. This was untrue. But then Gianni Versace happened to see Andrew and approached him and said, I know you, Lago di Como, no? According to Maureen Orth, this was just the line that Versace used when he wanted to strike up a conversation with someone. But Andrew saw an opportunity and was like, that's right. Thank you for remembering, Senor Versace. And then he told everybody this embellished story saying, and then I said, if you're Gianni Versace, then I'm Coco Chanel. (laughs) So. Andrew's friend Liz and her fiance Phil also recall how Andrew jumped on their bed in the morning shouting, you'll never believe who I went clubbing with last night and repeated the Coco Chanel joke. He told everybody this fucking joke. Again, Versace's family denies that they ever met. In the summer of 1991, Liz and Phil decided to move to Sacramento. So Andrew had to go live with his mom again in a two bedroom apartment in Rancho Bernardo and re-enrolled in the University of California, San Diego. He had to get a job at a thrifty's drugstore to make ends meet, which was not something he was happy about. Living with his mom also really got to him. She was pretty eccentric and she talked a lot. She also smoked a lot and she threatened suicide often. Their neighbor, Hal Melowitz, a psychiatric social worker who befriended Marianne, remembers that she was under psychiatric care and suffered several nervous breakdowns, the first at the age of 39 when Pete broke a chair over her. Oh, my God. I know. Andrew seemed totally indifferent towards his mother. He would party for days at a time and then come home to crash. And he demanded that she remain absolutely silent while he slept, no matter what time it was or how late into the afternoon it was. He wouldn't allow her to go to the thrifty drugstore where he worked, and he would literally fly into a rage if she showed up. She would make him whatever he wanted to eat, even if she only had $15 and he wanted steak for dinner. He pretty much would come... I was going to say that sounds like a typical Italian mom. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. But probably Pete beat her into doing that shit, you know? Yeah, that's crazy. He pretty much would come home, eat, and do his personal stuff, and then go back out to party, which is sad. Like, he's a lot like his father. He never sat down to talk to her or to ask her how she was feeling. And yet, whenever he would stop at home, she clung to him, and she would ask him, well, do you want to eat something? Well, when are you coming back? Like, she was just desperate to have him spend time with her. Yeah, that's so sad. Their neighbor, Elizabeth Oglesby, the psychologist, says that he confided in her, although he also made up a lot of stories. He didn't tell the truth about his parents, but he did tell her that he didn't get along with them, and he basically rejected them. Hmm. One time in 1993, he lost his temper and slammed his mother against the wall so hard that she fractured her shoulder and had to wear her arm in a sling. When she went to the emergency room, Andrew allegedly warned her that if she told anybody, he would kill her. Oh, my God. Despite all the violence, Marianne clung to him. According to the other neighbor, Melowitz, you need a crowbar to pry her away from her son. 
Andrew began befriending older men at gay clubs and also reportedly making violent pornography. He was using drugs like crystal meth, and apparently crystal meth is big among the gay community, especially in San Diego in the 90s. It was also popular among porn stars, from what I read, and it can keep you having sex or thinking about sex all day long. Oh, wow. Andrew also watched a lot of porn, and he tried to work as a porn star. Apparently, that was considered like an ultimate celebrity to him. Like, in a way, it proved that you're attractive. Oh, because people want to fuck you? Exactly. He became well-known in the gay nightlife and basically lived off of selling drugs and laid, letting older men take him out and spoil him. When he did have money, he would flash it and buy rounds for everybody. He was super show-offy. And he was also so classy and charming and educated and cultured. And he was pretty attractive. Like, not super attractive, but attractive enough. So these older men just loved bringing him to events and showing him off at parties. It was said that Andrew was also like a middleman, kind of helping the older closeted men hook up with younger men. Oh, so he was like a madame as well. Yeah. Yeah. But like enough, like friendship wise, you know, like he wasn't really taking money from it. He was just kind of like, I, I think he liked the respect, you know, everybody knew him and everybody needed him. Right. Among these older men was a guy named Lincoln Aston, who was a wealthy 60 year old architect who had once been married and had an attraction to younger men. Andrew and his friend Robin started hanging out with a circle of prominent older gay men and going to cocktail parties and dinner parties with them. And some of them would catch on that Andrew couldn't possibly have done all the things that he had claimed. Like he literally couldn't have been alive long enough to accomplish all the things he claimed. Right. Andrew befriended a young salesman who told them where he could get a job as a male escort. So Andrew went to Florida and did just that. Now, this might be a coincidence, but this particular salesman had clients who were executives of the Home Shopping Network headquartered in St. Petersburg, Florida. One of Andrew's victims later on, his name was Lee Miglin, and he had a wife named Marilyn who was associated with the Home Shopping Network, and Lee helped her run her business in the early 90s. It's not known for sure if Andrew personally knew Lee Miglin or not. It might just be a coincidence. Huh, that's really interesting. So Marianne found all these expensive clothes in Andrew's closet with the tax still on them. And she was baffled to see like $700 suits and $300 shoes when Andrew didn't even have a job. So like she found all these matchbooks from clubs and bars and she called them up and they told her straight up that they were gay clubs. But she was in absolute disbelief and denial. Like she was in total denial that her son could be gay. Andrew did have legitimate friends, though, like. He had a little clique that he hung out with because Andrew was the life of the party and he knew everybody. He was really popular in any room he was in. He was the one who everybody wanted to talk to. But those who knew him best knew that Andrew was pretty full of shit. They noticed that he was always driving around in other people's cars and he was staying at different people's houses. But he never made like friendly conversation about these people or who they were. You know, what's funny. Have you seen that uh, show? What is it? Making Anna? Inventing Anna. Inventing Anna. Yeah, that this reminds this is like the male version of that. You know what? That's a good point. Sorry. That's a good point. I didn't even think about it. He, he really is like inventing Anna. So like Andrew's friends would just allow him to live in his fantasy world without challenging him, because if they did, he would just become obnoxious and push and push with his stories. And then he would eventually become pouty. Pow- pouty. That didn't sound right, did it? Powie. Powwow. <laughs> Powie. Pow pow. <laughs> in effect, this basically made every single person in Andrew's life an enabler. Pretty much. But he like forced them to be. He was like, you're going to enable me or I'm just going to be really mean to you. And I'm going to slap you on your back. Or really annoying. Hard. Yeah, annoying I know. As fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to shut up about it. So you might as well believe it. Pretty much. So around late 1992, early 93, Andrew met a guy named Jeff Trail. Jeff was a former Navy officer and had been struggling with his homosexuality and his sense of identity. He grew up in an all-American kind of family, and being gay in the military wasn't easy in the early days of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So Jeff and Andrew met, and they were both in awe of each other. Not in a sexual way, they were just friends, but Jeff was kind of in awe of how flamboyant and carefree Andrew was, and Andrew really admired Jeff with his uniform and his classy upbringing. So Andrew would introduce Jeff to all kinds of cute boys, which was helpful considering Jeff was still pretty in the closet. So his meeting with boys was very underground. And by boys, you mean just like 20 year old, his his own age. Yeah. Okay. But that's how they were like, oh, my God, that boy is so cute. What a cute boy, you know? Right. So Jeff started coming to terms with the fact that he was gay and he started pulling in guys left and right. 
And it's because he was legitimately a nice and charming man. And he was such a gentleman that people were so attracted to him. Jeff's career interest was drifting more in the direction of law enforcement. So he bought himself a gun and he and Andrew, who had a fascination with guns, would go target shooting the other. But there was one thing that Jeff didn't tolerate, and that was drugs. And everybody knew that Andrew sold drugs. And that's literally how he got all his money. And they tried to tell Jeff, but Jeff always backed him up because Andrew would lie to him about where his money came from. And he would claim that it was from his parents or something. And the more that people try to warn Jeff, he would be like, look, I know, but I can't just leave him out in the cold. He looks up to me. He would tell people that Andrew was somebody that like, you might not like him all the time, but you're still always going to stand by him. Kind of like how you would with a brother. Right. Jeff was a ride or die. He was a military man. They all are. Yeah, you're right. He was very loyal. What people didn't know at first was that Andrew was not just selling drugs. He was also using them. He was a habitual user of crystal meth, as well as marijuana, cocaine and prescription downers like Vicodin, Xanax or Valium. He kept this very, very private. But those who hung out with him a lot did notice that he was like really hyper a lot of times. And then he would like crash at other times and then he would come back up. Okay, so a little bit ago, I mentioned that Andrew hung out with an older gentleman named Lincoln Aston. I don't know if the two of them ever hooked up because they were both pretty private about their love life like that, but they did hang out in the night scene for sure. They would go to clubs together and go to dinners together. While hanging out with Lincoln Aston, Andrew was introduced to a man named Norman Blanchard and they begin a relationship in 1994. Norman Blanchard was basically his sugar daddy, but he didn't seem to get much sugar. (laughs) Norman was 58 and soft-spoken, conservative, and very, very rich. Norman lived in Phoenix, but he had a condo in La Jolla, so he would go visit Andrew often. Norman had actually just recently lost his partner of 26 years to AIDS. Andrew's friends would say that he thoroughly researched Norman and his sources of money. That's so sad. Yeah, it is. Are you going to tell me that he kills these people? Um, not yet. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I'm like, I'm not going to tell you that yet. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but yeah, there's a reason I'm telling you about this. Oh, these people. Sorry, spoiler, Andrew's a serial killer. <laughs> Fucking asshole. <laughs> Norman was cautious with money by nature, which was frustrating to Andrew. He let him move in with him and spoiled him with an allowance of $2,500 a month. He took him on fancy vacations. He gave him lavish gifts and basically anything he wanted, ensuring that Andrew could live any lifestyle he wanted. Unfortunately, Andrew was entitled as fuck and started demanding things like his own place and his own car. And realistically, Andrew wasn't offering much to the relationship. They slept in separate beds, so they didn't have sex. I mean, that's debatable. Some people believe they did have a sexual relationship, but most don't. Like, they really did have two separate twin beds. So basically, he was just using him for his money and stringing him along. And I think this guy did like having him on his arm because Andrew was so classy and cultured. He was basically like a tour guide who was good looking and made Norman look good. Mm -hmm. It probably was fun for Norman. Still, Andrew would complain to his friends that Norman was cheap. Like he basically let Andrew decorate their home and like he let Andrew tell him what to buy all the time and like where they were going to take their trips. But Norman didn't like to take first class or business class, for example. He liked to take coach. But he fucking would take them to like $5,000 hotels then, you know? Right. Norman just wasn't frivolous like Andrew was. He actually wanted to pay for Andrew's education or his career. He gladly would have paid for Andrew to put his brain power and his talent to work. But Andrew was not interested. He wasn't just greedy. He was also pretty lazy. Well, yeah. And we already know that he had like zero ambition to, to be anything. Right. In early 1995, their mutual older friend, Lincoln Aston, seemed to be becoming skeptical about Andrew. He was heard saying that guy would have to be at least 10 years older than he says he is in order to do all the things he says he's done. And he was also warning people to avoid Andrew. In May of 1995, Lincoln Aston was murdered. The official story is that he was murdered by a male hustler, but there are a few people who believe that Andrew may have been involved with it. Later on, Andrew got Norman to buy him his own place. And coincidentally, maybe, this new place happened to belong to Lincoln Aston. What? Yeah. And that's, again, the official story is that some other guy came forward and admitted to killing him. 
but yeah. So was Norman and Lincoln friends or was it the yeah. only link? Oh, okay. No, they were all friends. That, that's the thing. Okay. They definitely knew each other and they all hung out together. Because I'm sitting here wondering, like, did they have mutual properties? Um, how? How? No, I don't that's think so. No, 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 no. It was literally like Andrew would like point to this like little valley or this little mountaintop and was like, I really would love to have a condo up there. I, I need that condo up there. And then one day Norman bought it for him. Doesn't seem like he knew that was Lincoln's place. Wow. I could oh be wrong. God. What if he killed him just to have that house? I, I, I don't know. Like I said, so somebody else came forward. That's what's so weird about it. But well, anyway, we let's move on. because we'll, Confessions all the time. I know. And I wonder why. But um, unless it's somebody, you know how people will go down for something because they're already going down for something else. Yeah. Like trying to get a plea deal or something. OK, jot, jot that down and we'll um, look it up for part two. So Andrew moved into Norman's condo in 1995, leaving his mother high and dry. That November, Pete suddenly stopped having his pension check sent to her, saying that they were intended for Andrew's schooling. So Marianne was forced to move back to Illinois, where her her elder children lived in 1995 and later went on um, to receive public assistance. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you about another guy named David Madsen. While Andrew was being kept by Norman, he would still go out with his younger crowd and try to hook up. He would leave town to go to San Diego or something, and he would tell Norman that he was actually going to visit his ex-wife and young daughter. Many of his friends didn't even know about Norman. One weekend in November 1995, Andrew was having dinner with friends at a restaurant in San Francisco when he noticed a cute, preppy blonde guy, David Madsen. David was so charismatic, and everybody said that there was like an instant spark between them. David was from Minneapolis in town on business. He was an architect. He also liked to live a certain lifestyle like Andrew, but unlike Andrew, David worked really hard for it. He was very driven and dedicated, and he earned everything he had. He was an aerobic ski and swimming instructor. His father said that he taught half the kids in their hometown how to swim. Oh, wow. Isn't that adorable? That is really cute. But he was really attracted to Andrew's flashiness. David, like Andrew, liked to be the center of attention, but as a peacemaker, unlike Andrew. He had a thing for the underdog and he was always trying to help people or uplift people. He was kind of drawn to people who needed him. Before meeting Andrew, David had a kind of traumatic relationship with a guy named Greg Nelson who would end up stalking David. He spread false rumors that David had given him HIV and he would call David as many as 120 times a day. He gave David's phone number to sex phone line so people looking for action would call him. Oh my he God. even took... He even sent pornographic literature along with a nude picture of David to David's job at a law firm, sending him to the senior partners saying, do you know what your employees do? Oh, my gosh. Is revenge porn illegal in 1995? <laughs> uh, is it in 2022? Is it illegal yet? Oh, my God. I don't even know. <laughs> I thought it was supposed oh, to be. Man. <laughs> <laughs> you like that tag group on Facebook that says. First I ha had, then I sat it. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's so me. relatable. <laughs> <laughs> so this guy ended up harassing David for over two years. He was finally jailed after repeatedly violating a court order to stay away from David. David was literally afraid to open his front door and he had to change his phone number numerous times. He never knew when he was going to walk outside and find his, his car all keyed up or something. And he absolutely hated violence. His father recalled taking him duck hunting once when they shot this duck and he cried and cried so badly that his father tried to like hide the duck behind a tree. But like David wouldn't stop crying. So he took the duck and like gave it to a neighbor to make it go away. <laughs> it was me when I was little fishing. It was horrible. It's just so fishing. Oh, my God. But this is so wholesome, you know, it is like he took him duck hunting and he's just oh, <laughs> anyway. There was also an incident when, when David was a dorm advisor, an angry student mistook him for somebody else and pushed him through a pane of glass. Oh he my was not God. injured. He, I keep waiting for your reaction. And then I don't, I'm so delayed. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> he was not injured, but of course he was really shaken up. And those seem like really good reasons to not be a fan of violence. Yeah. I mean, for sure. David also struggled with his sexuality. His family was religious and it was just really hard for them to grasp. But even so, 
when David came out to his father, his father was basically like, I can't say I understand because I don't believe in that, but I don't love David any less or view him any differently. David tried to date girls and even fell in love with one woman. He teeter tottered on whether he was straight or gay or bisexual, but he knew that he was attracted to men. So David and Andrew started a long distance relationship. Andrew had to keep David a secret from Norman and he had to keep Norman a secret from David. So because of this, Andrew could never leave David a phone number where he could call him. So David just had to wait around for Andrew to call him. Andrew would send him these cute letters and postcards from different places, but David was only allowed to write back to a post office that Andrew rarely checked. He told David that his family had to keep a low profile because there were potential kidnap victims. He was like super cryptic like that. What the fuck? <laughs> He's probably like, yeah, my dad was kidnapped and taken to the Philippines and now he lives on a dirt floor. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew and David would see each other every two or three weeks or so, but Andrew would also start hanging out at gay bathhouses where drugs were prevalent. Do you know what that is? A bathhouse is like a spa. Yeah, I didn't know that. Apparently it's like um, they're like saunas and locker rooms and like showers and stuff. Yep. But apparently at these gay bathhouses, like um, you would pay for, for the <laughs> services like the shower. Yeah, but people would go there and like prostitute or sell drugs and stuff. And it was supposedly like discouraged by the owners, but they knew what it was. And they were people who would end up like living there, like spending 24 seven there. Where do you sleep on a facial bed? Well, I'm kind of wondering <laughs> if that's the thing, if these were like homeless people who would just like do crack to stay awake all the time and hang out there, yeah, you know, to oh. not be in the street. I'm, I wonder, you know? Yeah. At least maybe I'm getting that impression because that's what it seems like Andrew does. He hangs out here when he's in between places. Hmm. Not just in between places. He does pop in and out to have sex. Is he still doing porn while he is with Norman? I don't think he was successful at doing porn. I think he tried to get into it, but he's he does like watch a lot of porn. <laughs> he's just a, a habitual masturbator. So Andrew started to explore SM and he planned to get David into it. However, he would tell all his friends that David was actually the one to introduce him to it. But before long, it became David won't let me do everything I want to do. There was a dungeon master, like the sexy kind, <laughs> who recalled Andrew kind of flirting with the idea of SNM, and he would come to him with questions about bondage and where to buy restraints and stuff. He even called him up and asked him about mixing semen with blood, like making a small incision into the chest or the arm and then ejaculating into it and mixing it. Oh. And even the dungeon master was like, it's very strange, and it's one way that HIV spreads. Yeah, that's a good way. Yeah. You just put it right in there. <laughs> a friend named john semero claimed that on more than one occasion he had dinner with andrew and david and they both wanted him to engage in a threesome with them which he never did it seems like david was a consenting participant in to these things at least to an extent he was said to have been seen going to these like themed leather nights and stuff at these clubs but it did get to a point where he said that sex with andrew was not just lousy he said that it was uncomfortable and not enjoyable. Oh. He said that Andrew kept trying to do things that he did not want to do. And when David said no, Andrew stormed out of the hotel room and went down to a restaurant and threw a little tantrum. Another friend who talked to David said, I know on two occasions, David talked to me about experiences with bondage, and it really wasn't his thing. On a personal level, David was submissive in bed, and he'd rather be manhandled than stroked. I'm a teddy bear at home, and David would ask me to be more aggressive. You know what? what? Huh? You I just, confused? yeah, I got confused by that. So the guy, the guy is saying that like David was submissive in bed. He would rather be manhandled. Like this guy was like a big softy and David was like, can you be a little bit more aggressive? So what I'm thinking is that maybe David wasn't into s and but maybe that's why he flirted with it. Maybe he did like to be like roughed up a little bit and manhandled and kind of grabbed. And maybe right. that's why he experimented with going a little further. Yeah. And then he realized that it was too much for him. Or at least Andrew was too much. You know, like I can imagine yeah. like you have to feel safe and maybe he was legit scared with Andrew. Right. Like he's going to cut me and come in me. That's. <laughs> Andrew had a friend named Doug Stubblefield who had done a college thesis on a homosexual philosopher who articulated going beyond the boundaries of normality. And Andrew went to him for advice on SNM videos to rent. 
Doug became concerned that Andrew was violating a fundamental tenet of the pain and pleasure principle that it has to be equal and balanced. He got the impression that Andrew was having trouble drawing that line and that he was trying to dominate David too much. Mm. Another friend said that Andrew treated David like a slave. He would give David the car key and then bark, here, go get the car. With David having such a hard time maintaining contact with Andrew, he started to suspect that Andrew was seeing other people. Andrew was like, well, I never said that I would be exclusive when we've only been going out on a few dates. And David was like, "Okay, I guess that's fair. But David started to feel the lack of being pursued. It's like he's always chasing Andrew down. Andrew's never coming looking for him, you know? Right. Hold on, let me put this cat out. Do you hear him? Yeah. <laughs> Hold on. You're so cute. One night, Andrew went to visit David and they ran into an old crush of Andrew's. He and David took a little walk and he warned David, Andrew is a pathological liar. It's crazy. You don't know who he is. Don't put anything you're not prepared to lose in that basket. He said that David listened, but it seemed like he wasn't yet ready to let Andrew go. He said he was very commitment oriented, very Minnesota, very trustworthy and reliable. In July of 1996, Norman took Andrew to France and Andrew, of course, flew through his allowance and then some. He decided that he should have a new Mercedes SL600 convertible that costs $125,000. And he gave Norman an ultimate. He doesn't get him the car. He was going to leave. Oh, okay. And Norman was like, sorry. So Andrew ended up packing his bags and leaving a note saying, I've moved on. But then he like shortly after that called Norman and left him a voicemail with his new cell phone number. And he fully expected uh, Norman to call him. So he just had like a full man grown temper tantrum and left Europe. <laughs> exactly. He, he, he couldn't have even like negotiated or asked for like a cheaper car or something. He was like the Mercedes or nothing. Right. And it's in Europe. They have to like bring it back here. That's a lot. And he fully expected Norman to crumble without him. And he did not. So Andrew ended up being forced to move into a weekly studio apartment rental. By now, Andrew had been promising David for months that they would spend the 4th of July together. But then he would send David a a postcard saying, I may not be able to come home in July. He implied that his family was involved in some kind of sinister activity. But anyway, the 4th, the 4th of July came and went and Andrew didn't come through and David had finally had it. So he cut Andrew off. So now Andrew had absolutely nobody because his sugar daddy just left him and his boyfriend just left him. And neither one of them knew that the other one existed to begin with. And now Andrew is all alone. So he wrote Norman a letter saying, I'll let you decide how much palimony you want to give me to compensate for my year of service. (laughs) Palimony. Oh, the audacity. Yeah. And Norman actually gave him $15,000 probably to be like, "Okay, now leave me alone. And then he took off to Europe with some new friends that he had met through Andrew. So he was probably like, fuck you, man. I'm I'm going to go hang out with my friends and never talk to you again. When Andrew tried to deposit the money, he tried to convince the teller at the bank not to report it to the IRS, which is a requirement for any check over $10,000. But the teller refused. I'm surprised he didn't get caught right then and there. Yeah, but I think those things take time. And he was really charming. Like he was a con artist. Like he Um, really was like inventing Anna. Literally. (laughs) He's inventing Andrew. (laughs) I love it. So now that Andrew lost Norman, he was desperate to get David back. But David was starting to get really shady vibes from Andrew. Andrew had once told him, there's someone in prison right now who got my friends in trouble. I've arranged to have him killed. Oh, there's someone in prison now who got my friends in trouble? Yeah, so I think that David was starting to not only be like, he doesn't have time for me anyway, but also like, I don't know if I want to open up this can of worms, you know? I don't know if I want to ask about it. Right. So Andrew started to realize that he had lost both David and Norman. So he decided to set his sights on the one person he still had, Jeff Trail. Andrew told him that he was coming to visit him for a few days, but that visit stretched into two weeks. Andrew went and got his hair cropped to look just like Jeff's. He spent the whole day with Jeff's boyfriend, Daniel, and he went on and on about how David is the love of his life and how he's the man that he wants to marry. Daniel got the impression that he and David were in a loving long term relationship, which, of course, wasn't true. He also kept giving Daniel drinks and he brought him home drunk, which got Jeff like really angry. 
Jeff was getting fed up with Andrew at this point, and he actually called up Daniel's mother and told her to do anything she can to keep Daniel from getting mixed up with Andrew. So it's interesting, like Jeff has been defending Andrew this whole time. And now that he sees him and like getting close to somebody that he loves and he's like, we got to we got to protect people from Andrew now. Right. Why the fuck did he cut his hair like Jeff's? That's a good point. I'm not really sure I understand that. Maybe he was kind of uh, infatuated with Jeff. I mean, Jeff kind of had everything he he didn't, you know, Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I was kind of wondering if maybe he was trying to steal his boyfriend away. It's either that or he's trying to pry in between them to get them to break up. So that it's weird. And and maybe that's another reason why Jeff was angry that he brought his boyfriend home drunk. You know, like maybe he was like, are you trying to take advantage of him? Right. Yeah, that's weird. Andrew was really feeling a sense of rejection now. He falls deeper and deeper into a crystal meth addiction, (laughs) addiction, (laughs) and his appearance really started to suffer. His sense of self-worth was directly tied to the things that he had and the people he knew and the things that people would do for him. So if he wasn't accepted by wealthy people in high society, he really didn't know who he was. So he was completely lost. Jeff Trail ended up finding a job in Minneapolis, and Andrew saw this as an opportunity to call up David and ask for his help to show Jeff around. But like Jeff also didn't ask for this. Andrew would just kind of barge in unannounced and be like, "Okay, I'm here to show you around town. And then like always, the trip would extend to like two weeks and Jeff was starting to get fed the fuck up. Jeff finally told Andrew, like, can you please just go check into a hotel or go home now? You have overstayed your welcome. Thank you. And this happened often with Jeff and David, and they just never had the heart to tell him. David was also super uncomfortable to have him barging in on his life. By now, David had a new boyfriend named Robbie, who was a tall, handsome black man. Andrew knew all about Robbie, but he still told David, I've changed. I'm becoming a better person, and I have you to thank for that. Mm -hmm. This was totally taking advantage of David's need to help the underdog. He couldn't not help somebody who was so wounded. Right. Andrew returned to Minneapolis in mid-November, and he attended a party that David and Robbie were throwing. The night before the party, Jeff and Andrew went to a bar where Andrew started talking to a guy named Joe. Andrew begged Joe to let him come home with him because he actually didn't have any place to stay. Because now Jeff and David both have boyfriends at home. (laughs) Andrew went home with Joe, and they went to bed together, but they immediately had an argument about who was going to be on top and who was going to be on bottom. Both of them were like, I am not a bottom. I don't like that. (laughs) Apparently, Andrew spent the next two hours all over him, affectionately smothering him. But when Joe tried to touch him back, he would freak out and be like, no, no, don't touch me. And like, oops, I got excited (laughs) and like put his push his hands away. So they never ended up having sex. But the next morning, Joe remembers waking up, having to fight Andrew off of it. And he also had numerous hickeys on his neck. Andrew had also bitten him on the chest and left him ugly bruises. Oh, my God. Okay, I'm sorry. But who is Joe again? Is this a new person? Some random guy that he met at a, at a bar. He was okay. hanging out with Jeff Trail, and I think he was just trying to find somebody to stay with. Okay. So he picked up a guy in, a, in the bar. And That's even though they didn't like each other, they spent, he, he spent the night there. And it's, it's like he knows he's overstaying his welcome, you know? Mm-hmm. So Joe couldn't wait to get him the fuck out of his house. So... He, in the morning, he drove Andrew over to Jeff's house. Andrew told him that he was cold and he borrowed a jacket from Joe, which cost $1,200. Andrew just like took the jacket home with him. And like a few days later, Joe saw him out in the street wearing it. But he was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'll take the loss. Oh, my God. Can you imagine loaning somebody a $1,200 jacket and just being like, I don't want to go anywhere near that guy? Yeah. Like that, that bad. You don't want to go near him that bad that you won't even get back your over $1,000 jacket. Right. So the night of the party, people noticed that Andrew's appearance had changed. He was wearing a nice suit, but it didn't quite fit him anymore. He was also a little bit like plump and he looked tired and worn down. Plus his behavior was downright bizarre. First, he loaded up a plate with hors d'oeuvres and he fed them to the dog after Robbie, that's David's boyfriend, had explicitly told everybody not to feed any hors d'oeuvres to the dog. By the way, David's dog was a Dalmatian named Prince, like Paw Prince. 
Oh, I know. I just love that. <laughs> so the dog promptly threw up. Good going, Andrew. Then Andrew picked up a picture of Rob and David together and said, this looks interesting. Like he was trying to get a reaction, but nobody ended up paying him any mind. Then he walked over to the table that had food on it and it had a couple of candles on it and he nudged a paper plate towards the flame intentionally. A friend of Jeff and David's named Rick like saw this and he pulled the plate away. But Andrew, undeterred, then put some napkins on the plate and shoved it into the candle flame. And then he dropped the flaming plate on the table and just walked away as he heard the smoke alarm go off. (laughs) Just for fun. What the hell? He's just like, hee hee, and then walks away. So Rob grabbed the plate and then he went and held it under a faucet. And then after that, Andrew went and started rubbing up against David and like whispering in his ear, like flirting with him. So Rob finally grabs him and pulls him into a corner and just slammed him up against the wall and said, excuse me, I understand you're excessive. I'm not going to have you pressing up against my man. While I'm here, you respect my presence or you won't be here. Ooh, go Rob. And and Rob is like a six foot tall black guy and gorgeous. So Andrew backed off saying, all right, man, it was a whim. And David was like, oh, my God, thank you to his boyfriend, Rob. He's like, that's so hot. (laughs) Well, poor David, too. He probably just he's probably been trying for a long time to, like, be polite to Andrew while trying to, like, give him little hints that he's not interested, you know? Right. It's like, and you look like shit. So and he's and he's aggressive. Yeah. After the party in an elevator, somebody actually turned to Andrew and said, you are such an asshole. (laughs) He was unaffected. Like we said, he knows he's staying his welcome or overstaying. It's so weird to me. Like, I, I feel like there's people like this everywhere. It's like they just are like so like broken or something that they just are destructive everywhere they go. And I think it's a little bit narcissism, too, that they just like take, take, take. And they it's not that they don't think about anybody else. It's that they don't care. Right. Everybody else is irrelevant. Right. It's so weird. So Andrew started frequenting a bathhouse called the Mustang Spa, which was open 24 hours. And he started like living there, like how we talked about. The owner said that he didn't think Andrew was going in there to have sex, but rather just walking around annoying people, like telling them his outlandish stories. He was also maybe looking for clients to sell drugs to. He was often hanging out with a couple of junkies who were clearly using him just for his drugs because like he he didn't fit in with them. Like they were like they looked like druggies and he did not. Right. The owner had said people start living at the baths because they don't want to focus on what's going on in their lives. He said he kept a close eye on Andrew and ended up kicking him out when he became too much, like just being there and being shady and selling drugs like it just became too much literally everybody around him sees him for who he is it seems as though it took a while and that's what's so interesting like the narcissistic part of him it's like he doesn't care if people don't believe him as long as they go along with it right as long as they let him tell his stories he doesn't care do you hear my child a little bit okay (laughs) not really She can't hear me. And that's the important thing. (laughs) Andrew was delving more and more into violent sexual fantasies. He would see a cute boy walking down the street and say something like, oh, I'd love to electrocute him. Oh, my God. Around February 1997, two separate bartenders noted independently that whenever anybody complained about somebody's behavior at the bar, Andrew would say, well, we'll just have to kill him. Oh, my God. He's getting so creepy. David and Rob ended up breaking up and David would soon get a new boyfriend named Cedric Rucker. He would kind of try to avoid hanging out with Andrew, but Andrew was always insisting or like offering some amazing trip or something. And David was kind of dazzled by it. And he kind of like just let him buy him stuff and like let him keep trying. (sighs) It's sad, but David also like liked living this nice life, you know, so some people see it as. David let him on or like used him. This is like watching a scary movie. It's like a suspense movie is what it is. So David's just like accepting all of these gifts and all the while telling him that he didn't want to be anything more than friends. They went on a trip to Los Angeles with a couple of other friends and Andrew again tried to get David into bed with him, but David didn't let up. 
it was like David finally had a little bit of control over the relationship. And that just made Andrew's rage build. Oh, God. Andrew went back to San Francisco. And one night he met a a 26 year old guy named Tim Schwager. Schwager. Swagger. Swagger. (laughs) At a dance club. So Andrew took him back to a fancy hotel and Tim says that his memories about that night are hazy. He assumes that he might have drank too much or he possibly might have even been drugged just because of like how bad his recollection is. Bill Cosby them. Dun, dun, dun. So like Joe, Tim had memory flashbacks of trying to fight Andrew off of him during the night and then woke up with three hickeys. He remembered going to sleep wearing underwear, but woke up completely nude. Oh, God. Okay. Before Andrew returned to Minneapolis for the final time, he stayed in San Francisco, clearly on drugs. He went out for the night and ran into some friends and was weirdly aggressive. Like his friend said that he would come up behind them and pick them up and spin them around or he would playfully put them into a chokehold that was like way too tight. His friends were straight up like, dude, you're hurting me or you're embarrassing me because he would do that thing where he would like pick them up from behind and then like jump up and down when it looked like he was humping them. And these were grown ass adults. Right. In a bar. Andrew hung out with his old friend, Stephen, and he told him about David and again talked about him like as if they were it, like a loving couple and made no mention of the fact that David had like already broken up with him and rejected him. He's like living in this fantasy relationship with him still. Mm-hmm. He's telling him things like he's the man for me. And Stephen asked him, why do you say that? Andrew's face contorted and he let out a loud manic laugh and said, well, he lets me do anything I want to him and just started cracking up. Oh, my God. He didn't like it, though, Andrew. So Stephen was like, like, what? Like, what does he let you do to him? And Andrew was just like, oh, you know, cages, harnesses around the genitals, latex masks. And Stephen was like, latex masks. Like, he was kind of freaked out by it. So Andrew was like, well, why don't you come back to the hotel with me? Like kind of implying that they were going to try some of those things. And Stephen was like, Andrew, we've been friends for eight years. Don't you think this is kind of silly? And Andrew was just like, yeah, maybe you're right. So Stephen, having known him for a long time, was kind of picking up on the fact that there was a different side of Andrew than he was used to seeing. Like Andrew was always the life of the party. He was upbeat and happy. And now he seemed like weirdly unfulfilled and troubled. Right. He seemed like the dark side of him. Right. By April 1997, Andrew had racked up over $40,000 on two credit cards and was totally broke. He had filed for bankruptcy and got American Express to purchase a ticket to Minneapolis. Nobody knew at the time, but this was a one way ticket. He began giving away all of his possessions and he told his friends that he had unfinished business with Jeff Trail. Oh, no. And that's where we're going to leave off for part one. Run, Jeff, run. So stay tuned for part two. Thanks again for listening. We hope you enjoyed the part one of the Gianni Versace story, Inventing Andrew. Just a heads up, we finally set up a Patreon with all of our episodes. For just $1 a month, you can support us and get exclusive access to behind the scenes footage. You will also get access to new episodes 48 hours before everybody else. Yay! Don't forget, you can also see my extensive notes for this episode on BrokenLimelight.com, where you can also see photos and interviews. You can buy merchandise, leave a comment, et cetera, et cetera. And okay, thanks again, fam, for all of your support. We love you. Love you guys. Bye. Bye. Hi, everybody. I'm Dee Dee West. And I'm Summer. And this is Broken Limelight. So today we're going to finish talking about the Gianni Versace story and the story of Andrew Cunanan and um, his killing spree, which I think you guys saw that coming, right? Oh, unfortunately. And side note, I call him Andrew Punani in my head. So. <laughs> <laughs> so we left off on part one with Andrew giving away his possessions and booking a one-way flight to Minneapolis to visit his friends Jeff Trail and David Madsen, who he was in love with. And he was telling his friends that he had some unfinished business with his friend, Jeff Trail. At this point, Andrew was in a lot of debt. He had no sugar daddy and no friends. And he was addicted to crystal meth and gaining a lot of weight and just looking kind of scruffy. So he just didn't have the same appeal that he did before. He wasn't 
able to like so easily wrap people around his finger. And he just pretty much didn't have anybody. And nobody really, really believed him anymore. So he was just feeling this sense of rejection that was literally making him crumble at this point. So he goes to Minneapolis and neither Jeff nor David wanted him around, but they couldn't bring themselves to tell him. David was really uncomfortable and also pretty distraught because his old stalker, Greg Nelson, had resurfaced. David was in a coffee shop one day when he looked up and he saw his stalker staring at him through the window. And a few days later, he found his Jeep dented and scratched ac- across the side. So David was just like uneasy altogether. You know, he, he didn't want to deal with Andrew right now. Andrew's plan was first to get back together with David. And if that didn't work out, Jeff would become the object of his desire. Jeff talked to his sister about his concerns with Andrew. And she was like, look, like you have a new boyfriend now. So you have to just tell him you owe it to him. So Jeff had this talk with Andrew and Andrew was not happy to hear that. Shortly after that, Jeff called up his friend Mike and told him that he and Andrew had a huge falling out and that he never intended to speak to him again. But by the end of April, Jeff had relented and it was decided that Andrew was going to go stay with both David and Jeff on the weekend of April 25th. (sighs) Jeff, though, made plans to be out of town that weekend. And he was like, I'm just going to leave you a key under the mat. Like he didn't want anything to do with it. He probably just couldn't get out of it. Like Andrew talked him into it. Because right. it, it, it seemed like he, it wasn't easy to relent, you know? Like all this time he's telling people, no, he's like a brother. Like you just kind of put up with him. And now he told somebody that they had a huge falling out and he was never going to speak to him again. Like it had to be pretty, pretty big for that to happen. Yeah. Another thing that might be important, Jeff had borrowed a lot of money from Andrew. Um, Andrew was kind of getting both David and Jeff addicted to the same kind of lifestyle as him. So like they would like to buy like electronics and new toys and like Jeff ended up in a lot of debt. So he ended up having to borrow like like a couple thousand dollars from Andrew. Oh, wow. So the fact that Andrew had lent Jeff some money might be the reason that Jeff wasn't ready to cut ties with him. Like maybe he felt like he, he owed him something. Right. Like he was obligated to stay friends with him because of everything he's done. Exactly. And maybe he still owed him money, too. Yeah, that's true. He didn't. He's like. A good guy. So he doesn't want to cut ties without exactly you know, paying him. But Andrew started pressuring Jeff to sell drugs like steroids for him. It's conceivable that maybe Andrew's reasoning for coming to see Jeff was to collect money that he owed him or to offer the steroids as a way to pay him back. Huh? Yeah, because steroids weren't the kind of drug that Andrew used. Obviously, he was lazy as shit. He didn't like to uh, work out, but he knew that like Jeff for example, new military people and stuff like that, that maybe they would be able to sell it in the Midwest for him. Right. It was becoming clear to Andrew, however, that David and Jeff were less and less willing to like allow him to extend his stays like he had always done. He was like clearly being rejected by these two guys who he had like, in his mind, he had lavished all this time and attention and like thousands of dollars on both of these guys. So he felt that he had been used and tossed away, leaving him alone, insecure, depressed, and overweight. And it was all their fault. Oh, no, it has nothing to do with the fact that you're just a piece of shit. That he scares the crap out of them and they owe him nothing. Right, exactly. (laughs) So Andrew packed up a duffel bag, including handcuffs, pornographic videos, and five glass vials of illegal steroids most likely for selling, or it might've even been a, a, like a love offering for David because he did like to work out as well. On Friday morning, Andrew got a ride to the airport from a friend named Ken Higgins. On the way there, Andrew went on and on about how much he hated Gianni Versace. He was deeply jealous and resentful of the rich and famous Italian designer who supposedly came from nothing and who through hard work became an international celebrity and gay icon. Yeah, well, he, he worked. That's the key here, Andrew. And I think that's what made him so angry. He's like, it's just not possible for me. He's like, I've tried doing nothing. And I just. (laughs) Andrew arrived in Minneapolis around 520 p.m. David picked him up and took him to a dinner with some of his friends. And the friends noticed that David seemed to be like kind of uneasy. But he said everything was fine. On Saturday night, they went to dinner and then they hit up some bars and they ended up splitting up. And Andrew uh, apparently spent the night at Jeff's apartment, but nobody knows for sure. The whole thing about this weekend is that there are no living witnesses. So a lot of the timeline is kind of pieced together by the evidence. And like, you'll see what I mean, but it's going to be a lot of they believe this is what it looks like. You know, we can't know for sure. Yeah, I really hate this. (laughs) Poor guys. 
so remember this was Saturday night when I said that um, David and, and Andrew split up and Andrew went to Jeff's house to stay the night, supposedly. Mm-hmm. So, so the next morning around 10 a.m., Andrew was at Jeff's house when a friend called for Jeff to tell him about a softball game that afternoon. Apparently, Jeff liked to attend these games and just like watch them. So Andrew, we know that he was there because he picked up the phone and took the message and jotted down a note for Jeff. And he signed it. Love, Andrew. He also made some long distance calls from Jeff's home, including a call to Norm to Norman Blanchford to say goodbye. Remember, Norman was his sugar daddy Mm -hmm. kind of like disinherited him. He said goodbye for what? Right. Exactly. Yeah. In fact, Andrew told him he realized their relationship was over and he was like, I'm moving from, I'm moving to San Francisco. I'll I'll stay in touch. And Norman was puzzled. He was like, I already knew you were moving, but okay. That morning, Jeff drove his boyfriend, John, to his job, which was at the Mall of America. On the way, he told John that he had something important to talk to Andrew about, but he didn't elaborate any further than that. And then Jeff did go ahead and go to Jerry's softball game where he told a friend that he was going to go home early to bake a cake for his boyfriend, John's birthday. Isn't that so sweet? He was like, I got to go bake a cake for my boyfriend. (laughs) Jeff went back to his apartment around three o'clock in the afternoon, but he didn't see Andrew. At about 530 in the afternoon, Andrew was seen getting into the elevator at David's apartment. He was by himself and he got off on David's floor and he did not want to stop and make small talk, which was unusual for Andrew. Mm hmm. Jeff's boyfriend, John, went home from work and took a nap. And at 8 p.m., Andrew called and left a voicemail saying, give me a call. I'd like to see you. Jeff immediately called back, but he told John that he was going to he was willing to blow him off so that they could go see a moving or something. But John was like, no, I want to go dancing. It's my birthday. So go handle that and I'll see you later tonight. So Jeff told John that he would meet him in between 10 and 1030 at a club called the Gay 90s. Unfortunately, Jeff wouldn't make it. Oh, no. Around 9 p.m., Jeff got in his 1996 Honda Civic to meet Andrew in a coffee shop. It's really unclear what important thing Jeff needed to see Andrew about because he never he never said exactly what it was. Plus, he was uh, avoiding him really hard and it was his boyfriend's birthday. So it was like, what could possibly be so important? You know, I wonder if it was about the steroids. Maybe he wanted to make money. Maybe. Or maybe he was going to give him money. I don't know. But here's something interesting. We think that Andrew stole Jeff's gun and Jeff was coming back for it because right now, as Jeff is like driving over to this coffee shop to meet up with him, Andrew is up in David's apartment with Jeff's gun. So maybe that's the important thing. He's like, give me my fucking gun back. Yeah. And he probably realizes that he's a little unhinged at this point. Yeah. That, I mean, that could be very well, like why he was so adamant on meeting with him. Exactly. So at 9.08, a phone call was made to David's apartment. We only know this because it was um, on the caller ID and it showed up with the phone number from the coffee shop where Andrew and Jeff were supposed to meet. So it's presumed that Jeff showed up at the coffee shop and then called the apartment to be like, hey, Andrew, I'm here. But then it seems that maybe Andrew told him, no, you come here. Because what happens is at 9.45, there's a buzz on the loft's intercom entrance, which like it or it didn't have a, a buzzer, so you'd have to actually call from downstairs and wait for somebody to come down and let you in. Mm. Now, David, remember he had a Dalmatian named Prince? He habitually walked his dog before the 10 o'clock news came on. So David goes out to walk his dog while Andrew's upstairs waiting in his apartment. Now, Jeff was at the coffee shop, and now he's heading over to Andrew's apartment. So David's downstairs, and he's like, oh, I'll let you in. Oh. Do they know that Andrew is upstairs at this point? I mean, does David know? Uh, I'm sure he does because Jeff was probably like, I'm meeting Andrew here. Why else would he be there? You know? Yeah. Um, so David, Jeff and their dog start. Wa- um, they go up the elevator and up to David's apartment. When they got there, Andrew was waiting with a claw hammer in his hand. Oh, God. As soon as they walked in, Andrew struck Jeff with the hammer. The first blow to his skull landed with knockout force, he must have raised his arms to shield himself because he was hit several times on his left wrist in his hand. Then he crumpled to the ground as he was hit with a total of 27 repeated blows to the face, head, and upper torso with both the blunt and the claw side of the hammer. Oh my God. And where was David and the dog? Standing there freaking out. Oh, Jesus Christ. And the thing about the dog is that Andrew had like dog sat for a lot of his friends, especially for them. So, This dog was very comfortable with him at this point. 
So it's, it's very possible that the dog didn't even bark or anything because somehow Andrew like calmed it down. Right. I feel like, don't you think dogs are smart enough to be like, whoa, like this, that's not okay. Um, I don't know. I think if my dog saw me kill somebody, they, she would assume that there was a bad guy and they'd be like, I I got you, mom. That's, you know, maybe this dog didn't know Jeff as well, you know? Yeah. That's, that's the only thing I can think of. Jeff's watch stopped at 9.55 p.m., which helps back up the timing of the attack because it's presumed that it either stopped from one of the blows or from, like, the weight of his body falling on his wrist. Oh, okay. I was like, how, how did that happen? <laughs> well, remember, he was raising his arms to, um, to defend himself, and he broke his wrist and everything. Oh, yeah. That makes sense. One of the blows was actually delivered before the front door had slammed shut, so it actually sent a splatter of blood, like, across the hallway. Oh, wow. There was even pieces of brain matter like lodged into the door, the door frame itself. A neighbor reported to the police that around that time he heard someone shouting, get the fuck out. And then that was followed by a door slam, followed by thumping noises that went on for like 30 to 45 seconds. Then the neighborhood footsteps racing down the hall and water running. He stuck his head out the door, but he didn't see anybody there. So he just like shut his door and went back to his apartment. Andrew knew how to successfully manipulate David, and he essentially told him, I could pin this entire thing on you. Oh, so he didn't kill him right then? Nope. He kept him alive. So David just stood there and watched the entire thing freaking out and like didn't know what to do. Oh, my God. So now Andrew's manipulating him and he's basically telling him, you're going to have to help me. And remember, David really didn't like violence. So like he just froze. And also he had been really skeptical, uh, skeptical about Andrew for a while. So he was kind of like even wondering if this guy had like mob connections, you know? Right. Plus, I mean, he's terrified of him and he just watched him murder somebody right in front of him. Right. And that's the thing. Andrew had like made all of these implications that he was going to have people killed and this and that because they angered him or like fucked with some of his friends or something. So this moment where he's seeing him kill like one of their closest friends, he's probably like, oh, fuck. Yeah, it definitely like solidified it for sure. He didn't have any options, so he had to tread lightly. So the two of them, well, we don't know (laughs) the two of them, either Andrew or David or both of them rolled up Jeff's body in an oriental area rug and they dragged him across the loft and they rested him against the back of the couch. They didn't really try to conceal him or anything. Like as soon as you walked in the front door, you could see the rolled up rug with like his legs sticking out of the top. And then they just threw like a little blanket over him. They used cloths and paper towels to clean up the blood, but they like left a lot of it. They left their sets of bloody footprints. They threw Jeff's watch and his Navy ring along with a bloody hammer and some cloths into a bag. And they just like placed it under the table. Oh, that's really good hiding there, guys. Yeah. And then they left Jeff's pager on his body. And for the next few days, it would just go off repeatedly because his body would just stay in the rug for a few days. Oh, wow. So remember, Jeff's boyfriend, John, was waiting for him at the gay 90s nightclub. He stayed there all night waiting for him. And at like 3 a.m., he went to Jeff's apartment. He went to bed, like wondering where his boyfriend was. And at like eight in the morning, he realized that Jeff wasn't still home. So he was like, "Okay, I'm going to call hospitals and like the jail and everything. So he starts calling everybody. He calls Jeff's work, but like he, he couldn't reach him. He spent all day Monday trying to reach his friend, Jerry Davis, the one who had played the softball game, but he also didn't respond. So John finally called the police, but they were not interested. They basically told him, you know, you can't file a report until 72 hours. Like if you want, you can call his parents and his parents can file a report. But that's about it. That is such bullshit. Mm -hmm. And he didn't want to fight. He didn't want to call his parents because Jeff wasn't out of the closet yet. Right. So like he didn't want to police like, oh, gay people don't want to be involved in that. Is that what that was? It's got to be. Yeah. And this was his boyfriend. So what is he supposed to say? Like, hey, he didn't come home last night, you know? Mm -hmm. So they basically told him he's a big boy and he can do whatever he wants, like implying that maybe he was just ghosting his boyfriend. David also missed work on Monday, even though he had an important meeting to attend. That afternoon, David's neighbor, Kathleen, came down the elevator of their lofts. And when it opened on the ground floor, she was face to face with David and Andrew. Later, she saw what looked like Andrew and David walking Prince, the Dalmatian, on a leash, which was unusual. He wasn't normally leashed. Hmm. I wonder if this was a way of Andrew controlling the dog, too, so that, like, David couldn't tip it off or something. Right. Or, like, or run after it. Yeah, exactly. 
David's coworker and friend Linda was concerned that David didn't show up for the meeting and nobody was able to reach him. So she and another friend named Laura went to his loft to check on him at about noon or about 12.15. They knocked on the door and they heard the dog pawing and scratching at the door, but nobody ever came and opened it. Linda, who was with David when he found his car, his car all keyed up from the, the, the stalker, she was now really concerned that he might be in trouble because of that. Right. So they called the police and the police didn't want to go into the apartment. They showed up, but they were like, well, if we damage the locks then we're going to have to negotiate payment with David. And if the dog becomes aggressive, we might have to shoot it. Do you want us to shoot the dog? Oh, my God. And they were just like, no, don't shoot the dog. So they were just like, thanks anyway. And they decided to call the superintendent of the building. They told her everything and she knocked on the door. And when nobody answered except the dog she decided to open the door with her own key. Once they opened the door, they immediately saw the rolled up rug with the body inside of it. They instantly thought that it must have been David. Right. So the police were called again and homicide came out this time. And Sergeant Bob Tichich said, we knew right away it may be a gay thing. Oh, my God. Yeah, I don't know what the fuck that means. Yeah, what about a body rolled up in a rug with the legs sticking out says, looks gay to me. They're like, it's a lover's gay gay quarrel. We don't, we don't. Exactly. That's exactly how they handled it. Call Reno 911. Okay. (laughs) And then they found Andrew's black duffel bag, which had like the steroids and the porn and the handcuffs. And they instantly just assumed that it all belonged to David, who was performing some kind of sex scene. (laughs) They were just like building off of this stereotype. By now, David and Andrew were actually riding down the highway in David's red Jeep. They would be on the road together for a few days. And again, there are no witnesses to what exactly happened other than like one or two spottings here and there. On Tuesday, April 29th, Jeff's pregnant sister went into premature labor. His buddy, Jerry Davis, was trying to reach Jeff's parents to tell him about Jeff's disappearance, but they weren't able to reach them because their daughter was in labor. So there was just a lot going on. And Jeff's disappearance just kind of went a little bit not unnoticed, but his parents just weren't reachable, you know? They were like they were in the middle of an emergency. Right. By now, Jeff's job was wondering where he had been. John kept trying to call the police who were like, so who are you? Are you his lover? And Jeff is just like, well, yes, but he's still fucking missing after going to hang out with this psychopath. Right. But they were less than helpful. <sighs> so frustrating. I know. On that day, on that day, police released a missing persons notice for Jeff Trail, not knowing that he was actually the body rolled up in the rug. Eventually, they realized that the body in the rug had black hair and David was a blonde, so it couldn't be David in the rug. And therefore, David must be the killer on the run. Sergeant Tichich had, like, no tact whatsoever, and he called up David's parents to find out, like, had you heard from David? And they were, of course, concerned, like, what is going on? What is he up to? And Tichich was like, you know, he's a homosexual, don't you? As if it fucking explained anything. (laughs) Isn't that such a weird stereotype? Like he's homosexual, so he's dangerous or right, problematic exactly. or something? But I just... This Must be a killer. Right. It's very frustrating. The body was finally removed from the rug on Wednesday, April 30th, and examined, and they examined it and discovered it to be Jeff's body. Jeff's boyfriend, John, had been relentlessly calling David's house looking for Jeff, and Officer Tichich picked up the phone. And he was like, who are you? And John was like, I'm Jeff's boyfriend. I've been looking for him for days. I called the police multiple times. And Officer Tichich was like, well, that's news to me. Oh, wow. Tichich informed him over the phone that Jeff was dead. His name is so frustrating to say, Tichich. Tichich. The police were trying to confirm whether the black duffel bag belonged to David or not. So Tichich called up David's friend to try to identify the duffel bag. And when she showed up, she was like, well, did you check the identification tag? And she pulled it open and it had Andrew's name on it. And Tichich was like, yeah, Tichich was like, how embarrassing for me. I guess you didn't have to come all the way down here. I just, I can't, I cannot. He's terrible, isn't he? Oh, there's a a tag on there. (laughs) (laughs) What a detective, you know? (laughs) The fuck? This random ass friend is just like, uh, did you look at this? (laughs) Did you look at the tag? You fucking idiot. (laughs) Anything else you'd like me to do while I'm here? (laughs) 
It wasn't until Thursday, May 1st, that David's parents were notified that David was missing. At that point, David and Andrew were long gone. Sometime between the Tuesday and the Friday after Jeff Trail's death, somebody reported seeing the red Jeep Cherokee driving north on Interstate 35, but the witness didn't see the driver's face. Remember, this red Jeep belonged to David and Andrew was driving it. Right. On May 3rd, after being missing for six days, David's body was found in tall grass at the edge of Rush Lake by fishermen. Oh, no. And what and we don't Minnesota. Oh, OK. It was still in Minnesota. Um, I want to say it was like 60 miles, 60 miles away from Minneapolis. Hey, hold on a second. So they left the dog in the apartment. Mm-hmm. OK. Yeah. So David was probably also really nervous about that. Probably real bummed out. Yeah, for sure. Oh. But we don't know when he died. It was sometime between Tuesday and Friday. They initially believed it was Friday, but the autopsy and everything um, determined that it was probably earlier than that. So again, we don't know exactly what happened. We know that David was shot three times through the eye, the head, and the back. Um, the fishermen did note that they thought that he looked surprised, like his eyes were wide open, like maybe... Andrew had like called out his name and he turned around and then he was shot. There weren't many defensive wounds. I think he had like a little mark, like a little bruise on his knuckle. So he was shot through the front and then also the back. So he was shot in the eye, the head and the back. So I'm not sure exactly how it happened. Like maybe he was shot in the back and then he turned around and hit him again Mm. twice. I I don't know. I feel like that makes the most sense. Yeah. I can't imagine how else it would have happened. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know. That, that's all That's all that, it, that the report says. He was shot in the eye, the head, and the back. And by the way, the shots came from the gun owned by Jeff Trail. Mm. It seems to me that it's most likely that David was killed around Tuesday because on Wednesday, there was a parking ticket in the car um, in Chicago. So that Jeep was in Chicago on Wednesday morning. Initially, they believe that maybe he went to Chicago and then came back, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't add up. You know, right. it's more likely that he killed him before he left the state and they just didn't find him for a few days. On Saturday, May 4th, Andrew would claim another victim in Chicago. This one is really unclear whether this was a random victim of opportunity or if Andrew actually knew this guy or had any motive at all for killing him. So this man was named Lee Miglin. Lee Miglin was a guy that I mentioned briefly in part one. He was a prominent real estate developer and his wife, Marilyn, worked with the Home Shopping Network. Remember, Lincoln Aston briefly worked with the Home Shopping Network also, but we have no idea if there is any connection there. Right. But remember, Lincoln Aston was the one who like we do know that he was friends with Andrew and then Lincoln died and some other guy took the fall for it. But then Andrew somehow ended up with Lincoln's condo. Mm -hmm. Very odd. It's all real weird. But again, we 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 just we just don't know. We don't know. There's nothing more than circumstantial evidence. There's right. nothing solid. Police found Meglin, who was 72 years old, with his, with his throat slashed ear to ear and his feet bound with masking tape. He also had like a plastic bag over his head and then it was like duct taped around his neck. And he had just two little holes like for his nostrils, which makes it seem like maybe he was being tortured. Right. He had also been tortured with a saw and a screwdriver. His ribs had been broken and he had been beaten and stabbed. And again, his throat had been slashed with a gardener's bone saw. Oh, my God. How did he find him if he if there was no connection? You know, it's just odd. I'll talk about that in a minute. What's interesting is the medical examiner found no defensive wounds on Big. Hmm. Also. Lee's body was wearing clothing, but there were no cuts in them, which like he had been stabbed. So Andrew had either lifted up Lee's shirt before stabbing him, or maybe Lee wasn't wearing clothing. And then Andrew redressed him after the attack. Hmm. Was this guy a part of the gay community or no, his wife was. I'll get there. (laughs) Don't worry. All of the it's it's a lot about Lee Miglin and all of the questions you're asking are the same questions I had. (laughs) <laughs> police also noticed that the suspect who we now know was andrew he had helped himself to a ham in the refrigerator and he just like left it on a desk like no plate or anything just like a whole ham 
that was half eaten on a desk. He also left behind a half eaten apple pie. He took a shower. No, I'm sorry. He took a bath because he left a ring around the bathtub. He was like grungy and he shaved, leaving all of his hairs in the sink. And they ended up finding this because they were black hairs and Lee Miglin only had white hair. So this made it clear that there was somebody other than Lee in the house. Detectives initially believed that Miglin didn't know his killer or killers, but rather believed it was a crime of opportunity and that Miglin was targeted because he was rich and vulnerable. Miglin's family maintained that the killing was random, but a former FBI agent named Greg McCrary suggests that it's unlikely that Andrew would have bound and tortured Miglin so brutally without any motive. Right. And it's so weird how each person he's killed so far is killed in a different way. It really is. So in the show American Crime Story, they portray it as if Lee is another one of Andrew's sugar daddies or like a client of his escort services. Like there's no physical evidence that Andrew or Lee Miglin ever met, like no connection. And Lee's family completely denies that he ever knew Andrew. And these investigators tried really hard to find a connection between them. In fact, it was like, more drama to the story that like this guy was a closeted gay, but like they couldn't confirm it. They couldn't find anything to like add to that. Now, when you ask Lee Miglin's friends, a lot of them did say like, well, some people were like, well, he's just very neat and maybe a little effeminate. Like he gets, he's always freshly manicured. And others were like, no, it was like a well-known secret that he was, you know, he, he was an underground gay, but again, it's not confirmable. Then again, I think that people like him and like Norman Blanchard and Lincoln Aston, all of these older men, and especially Lee Miglin, he was like a very neat and organized guy. And I just, I think that if he wanted to keep this a secret, he would be very good at it. Right, you know, exactly. They would use all of their connections to keep this quiet and like leave no paper trail, you know? And like Andrew probably knew this too. He probably had his ways around. Uh, he was known for being discreet. Like that's why these older guys liked him. It's just odd to me. How would he know exactly where, where was he at, at his house? Yes. Okay. So let me get into that. An initial theory was that Lee Miglin had parked his Lexus in his garage and like walked across the alleyway and maybe was about to open his gate when somebody stuck a loaded gun into his back and ordered him into his other garage. But I'm going to tell you why that doesn't make any sense. So Lee Miglin's house actually had like three parking spaces, like a driveway. He had a garage that was actually not like directly behind his house. It was actually like he had to cross this alleyway and it was like diagonal from his house. It was like a 30 yard walk. And like Lee Miglin kept the green Lexus in that garage, but there's no way that like somebody would have known that. Like, unless you knew the Miglins, you wouldn't know that this garage diagonal from them was theirs and that their car was parked there. And also If some stranger happened upon him in his garage, how would he know which house was his? Like, maybe he put a gun to his back, but would would he really, like, this was, like, in the afternoon, in broad daylight, would they really walk 30 yards with a gun to his back? And would Lee really be like, okay, let me just show you where it is, you know? Right. So does he live in Minnesota? Chicago. They're in Chicago now. Okay. Mm, I, I don't know. I just feel like that's way too coincidental that he just happened upon this guy who might be a closeted gay who also has connections to somebody that he already knew who was murdered and the thing with the closeted gay thing is it's hard because like i said it was a fun story to tell so like Mm -hmm. we don't like and and with this case a lot of people made money off of telling stories uh, like connected to it and i think everybody really liked the spotlight they got from being attached to it so it that's one of the reasons it's so it's so hard to take anybody's account, you know, and there's right. so many people anyway. Yeah, it's just it doesn't it doesn't make sense to me that it was so random. Right. So it is possible that I mean, the only way this makes sense is if the person knew their way around the house, which wouldn't make sense if this was random. Right. And also, how long is this in between them? leaving David's apartment to where he's in Chicago. They left David's apartment Monday and this is now Saturday. So in, I mean, say for instance, just like hypothetically, if he were to like be putting out an ad to like find somebody to like have sex with or something like, Mm -hmm. how was he just finding this random man? I don't know. It's just, it's odd. 
And it's a very right. short or this time or this period. random man. Maybe he called an escort service or something that Andrew signed up for this one time. Like, hey, I'm in Chicago this weekend. You know, we don't know. Um, yeah, it's a lot. But there's more. Um, but wait, <laughs> there's also more indicating that Andrew was comfortable in this house, like with the way he just like ate the food and shaved and showered. But that could just be, you know, a fucking psychopath. Maybe but he it, just felt at home because it was a nice big house. <laughs> yes. But here's the thing. Andrew also like research his targets, his clients. He wasn't about to go with people who didn't have any money. And how could he be so sure that Lee Miglin's wife wasn't going to come home? Like, did he know that she was out of town that weekend? He took his sweet time taking a shower and, you know, leaving a ham and shit, you know? <laughs> did he cook the ham? I wonder. <laughs> I think it was a leftover ham. So weird. I, I, you know, I'm no investigator, but. I know I, I could do like a whole thing on Lee Miglin. Going back to the overkill, um, like why? He was an old man and he just like broke his bones and stabbed him a bunch of times and like wrapped up his head. Like why the escalation here? You know, why Why was it so brutal with Jeff? And then it, slow, it de-escalated with David and then it escalated with this old man. So I think he was pissed at Jeff for something. I think David was like... Um, it was for collateral damage. Yeah. yeah. Because he shot him. There was no like defensive wounds for this guy. It seems like his sexual acts may have been Boom. progressing. Okay. So that's a couple of things. One thing is, and I just read this from, um, <laughs> I just heard this on criminal mind. So correct me if I'm wrong, but I've heard that like sexual sadists sometimes that's why they stab and that's why they stab over and over and over again. It's like a form of penetration that they're getting off on. Also, and I apologize for some of the outdated language in this. Remember, this this book was it from 1997. So some of the terms just aren't so like they're a little bit tone deaf. There was a bar called Gay 90s. OK, <laughs> so. yeah. So William Hagmeyer, he was the head of child abduction and serial killer unit of the FBI. That was like the, the profiling unit. He said there was a tremendous amount of overkill. Those are the kinds of things you see sometimes in homosexual murders this tremendous stabbing over and over. If Miglin is a total stranger, then Miglin reminds him of somebody else that he had a tremendous amount of anger toward. Or maybe Miglin isn't a total stranger. Hagmeyer also adds that the brutality could have been triggered by drug use, or maybe Andrew had just like watched a really sadistic movie. He said, this could be like living out a fantasy from some movie or book that he's read. Ted Bundy used to do that with his victims. He dyed their hair, cut it in different ways, put different clothes on them because he was reenacting covers of detective magazines. Oh, I never knew that about him. Neither did I. Um, there was another FBI agent in the profiling unit who was in charge of, of Andrew's case. And he said, with a city of the size, with a city the size of Chicago, the chances of him just happening to go down that alley behind Midland's townhouse and then seeing him in the garage, that's so remote. Mm-hmm. Here's something else that's interesting. So Lee Miglin had a son named Duke. Duke was like blonde, rich, handsome, exactly the kind of guy that Andrew would be hanging out with. Mm -hmm. um, there's also no confirmation that they ever knew each other. But there was one guy named Ron Williams who used to go out to dinner with Andrew. And he says that in 1994, Andrew told him that he had a business connection who was a rich, older investor in Chicago named Duke. Which is weird, but you know how Andrew liked to lie and just kind of mix up names and change details here and there? Oh, okay. But it could be nothing. It's But still, when this guy, Ron Williams, heard that Lee Miglin was killed by Andrew, he was just like, and that and that Lee had a son named Duke. He was like, whoa. And this yeah. was in Chicago? You know? There's no way he didn't know him. Right. It's just like things added up in the strangest way. Like, they didn't 100% add up. But maybe that's why Andrew did that, you know? It was harder to keep up with his lies. Right. Another guy named Jack Schaefer said that he ran into the Miglins a few years back at an airport and they were waiting for Duke to join them. Duke showed up with a friend who made a great impression. When Jack was showed a picture of Andrew, he went, yeah, that's the guy I saw with Duke. What? So maybe Andrew knew Duke and was looking for him when he found Lee. Or like maybe he had met Lee through Duke and like maybe hung out with both of them. Like maybe they were both a part of this gay group. Who knows? This gay group, you know what I mean? Like their little fraternity of rich gay men, <laughs> right? But like I said, they tried really hard to find a connection between Lee or Duke and Andrew, and they couldn't find anything, at least nothing concrete. Like anything they did find were like, no, that 
that can be proven beyond reasonable doubt. So we're not going to, we're not going to move with this. I feel like back then it was a lot harder to have like super great paper trails and like concrete evidence because people weren't texting. They weren't, you know, there wasn't social media. Right. It's That's a lot exactly to find connections between people. When the profiler said, if this was a random killing, then Lee Miglin reminds him of somebody he's angry with. What came to my mind was, what if this man is a surrogate for Norman Blanchard, who just disowned him and disinherited him? You know, the thing that gets me is that there's no defensive wounds. That's what makes me think that maybe this was a sexual thing. So I'm wondering if maybe it started off as sex or bondage that Lee Miglin consented to, and then Andrew pushed it. Right. I agree. That's exactly what I was thinking when I heard the bag and the fact that his feet were bound and there's not many defensive wounds, unless he was able to like overpower him really quickly. It just doesn't make sense why Lee Miglin wouldn't fight at all. Every, everybody who knew him says he would have fought. Like it doesn't make sense, you know? Mm. That's that's the one thing that makes me feel like it can't be random because why didn't Lee Miglin fight if this was just some random intruder, you know? Right. That's what makes me feel like they must have been in the middle of a sexual encounter that he consented to and he didn't know he was going to die. Yeah. Um, so Lee Miglin's wife, Marilyn, returned home from her trip when she found her house empty, but a few things were out of place. There was a half eaten pint of ice cream just left on the counter and, of course, the ham sitting on the desk. And Lee wasn't the kind of guy to leave things out like this. Also, their green Lexus was missing. So Marilyn got this really weird feeling that somebody else was in their house and something happened to Lee. So Andrew took off with Lee's green Lexus and he just left behind the red Jeep, just like not far from Lee Miglin's house. This would become like his signature, just leaving cars behind. Uh Now, the Lexus was equipped with a car phone, which, according to the records, was activated on May 4th, meaning either Andrew tried to use the phone or it activated when he turned the ignition on. So police began tracking the vehicle through the car phone and the fucking media released that information where Andrew just like heard it on the radio and then tried to destroy the phone. Oh, oh my God. On Friday, May 9th, a guy named Bill Reese, who worked in a cemetery, stopped to pick up mail on his way back from work. Andrew either saw him and followed him there or he just like happened upon the cemetery where he worked, which would have been kind of weird because it was like rural. Andrew shot and killed him. And this one really was just a crime of opportunity. He made him kneel down and then shot him in the head with Jeff's gun just so that he could steal his red Chevrolet uh, pickup truck. Andrew used this truck to drive to Florida. He abandoned the green Lexus and police quickly figured out that this was Andrew killing his fourth person in 12 days. Because Andrew, not just did he abandon the Lexus, he also left behind Lee Miglin's wallet and his credit cards, as well as a plastic garbage bag with one of Lee's shoes, which the other one was on Lee's body. What? I know. It's like it, he must have done this on purpose. He wasn't stupid, you know? So police kind of feel like he's leaving us breadcrumbs on purpose. Right. He also left two random photographs in the car. One was with, of Andrew and his friends at a party. And another one was with of him and his buddy Robbins just like posing in swimsuits. It was so weird. Like, why like he's, like, he's like telling on it's like he's playing a game or something he wants them exactly he wants them to know like look at me leaving behind another car and you still haven't caught me and you still don't know where i'm going it's like he wants them to know this was fucking me so i guess maybe because he knew that the car phone was allowing him to be tracked maybe he just like made it a mission to find somebody that he could easily take their vehicle yeah he must have also known that when they were tracking the car phone like there was no escaping that He was like, fuck it. Might as well own it. Andrew was very much at large now and people were scared. Bill was killed in such a remote area that people were worried they couldn't even hide. And now everybody in the gay community, like anybody who's ever met Andrew or ever been his roommate or ever gone out with him are like, oh my God, am I next? Like, I really like, they're trying to remember like, fuck, did I say something rude to him? Like, what did I last say to him? (laughs) Oh God, I can't even imagine. The police were focusing their search on the red truck that he was driving. They questioned a few people, but they like didn't want to hear anything that anybody had to say. They would ask people, where would Andrew go next or who would be his next victim? Multiple people tried to tell them things about Andrew's personality and they refused to listen, even saying that being gay was irrelevant to the case. But like, is it? 
It's like his total victimology, you know. Even the profiling unit tried to give insight to police and the rest of the FBI didn't want to listen. One FBI agent said, we already knew who Kunanan was. We interviewed hundreds of his associates. We don't need the profiling unit to tell us he's going to go hang out in gay bars. They really didn't give the profiling unit any credit, which, again, it reminds me a lot of Criminal Minds when the BAU comes in to help with the murder and the local police are like, oh, why don't we need them? We can do this without them. Yeah, that's weird. (laughs) They just don't want anybody's help. The FBI's refusal to talk about Andrew's homosexuality was really problematic. There was a general unease among law enforcement when working with with homosexuals. One investigator said, we used to call them phagocytes. What? Oh, like instead of homicide, it's phagocyte. Uh That's insane. A coordinator of the Minneapolis Gay and Lesbian Anti-Violence Project said, 75% of gays would not call law enforcement regarding crimes. They may not be out. They may feel shame or guilt. There's also a lot of distrust in a history of slow movement and a failure to respond. Right. I mean, seriously, like when they realize that they're gay, they're like, ah, oh, don't want to be messing with that. Exactly. So why would you why would you seek help from someone like that? Another activist talked about how this could be a lifestyle issue. For the most part, gay people are able to move through the mainstream, but there are segments of the community who just aren't. Some people have had bad experiences with straight people and don't want to be involved with them. Some grew up in small towns where it's a huge stigma. And so the only way to have contact with other gay people is to have illicit sex in bars or parks and in the dark. So they learned that this was the only way they could be gay. And cops were just not allies to this community. After Bill Reese's body was found, reporter Maureen Orth caught wind of the story. She sensed that the story might be worth reporting on, and she got the green light from Vanity Fair to begin reporting. Over the next few weeks, she set out to learn everything she could about Andrew Kunata. On May 12th, police reached out to Andrew's mother, Mary Ann. She told them that she hadn't heard from him in over two years. Andrew started staying at a hotel in Miami Beach, Florida, where he paid $29 per night in cash. On May 13th, Philip Merrill, remember that was uh, Liz Cody's fiance, and Liz was Andrew's best friend? So they called the FBI to volunteer their help in finding Andrew. According to Philip, the FBI asked him, where do you think he'll go and who do you think he'll get in touch with? Philip said Versace. He was sure of it. He also mentioned a guy named Harry DeWilt. He was a socialite that was hanging out with Versace on the night that Andrew supposedly met them. But the police didn't include this in their report and they refused to comment on that. Philip told them to think of places that could appear on Robin Leach, uh, the lifestyles of the rich and famous. He said that these were the types of places where Andrew would go. He also told them to warn the owners of 7-Elevens to look out for anybody shopping for Fritos and milk. Apparently, Andrew liked to eat Fritos and drink milk, and he would sometimes go a day and a half without eating any real food in between. Ew. An absolute psychopath. That's why he was, I'm just wondering how he's fat on meth, but I feel like (laughs) Fritos and milk will do it. (laughs) You know what though? They talk about that too. How like, yeah, meth typically is something that people lose weight on, but if you use it enough, you'll, you'll eat, you know? Oh my God. I imagine it's kind of like how if you smoke enough weed, it just doesn't make you tired anymore. Right. Or like give you the munchies or make you feel high. (laughs) Yeah. I wish it didn't give me the munchies. (laughs) In early June, the police questioned Norman Blanchard about Andrew Cunanan and his whereabouts. I can imagine the conversation going something like, so, Mr. Blanchard, what can you tell us about Andrew Cunanan? And then Norman was probably like, well, he's an Arabian prince who was married to a Jewish princess and owns a plantation in Manila. Because remember, Andrew didn't tell him any of the true story. (laughs) (laughs) He's a Jewish prince. Yeah, he used to tell people all this random shit, remember? (laughs) Yeah, he lived in Manila in a plantation. What are you talking about? Uh, Seriously, though, he did tell the police like he didn't know he didn't really have a good idea, but he had a hunch that Andrew might be in Miami, particularly the South Beach area. He had no specific information about why he thought this, but he said that Andrew told him a while back that he had visited there before. And Blanchard just thought that it'd be the logical place for Andrew to blend in. Mm -hmm. But Blanchard's suggestion doesn't show up in FBI files either. Aside from Phil Merrill and Norman Blanchard, there were two other friends of Andrew's who also said that they mentioned to FBI that Andrew had met Gianni Versace, but this was not noted in their police reports either. Did they think that it was just like so unlikely? I don't know. I really don't know. The family and and the police are like, oh, he didn't know him. But all of his friends are like, oh, he's probably at Versace's. 
even if he hadn't met him, he told people he met him. You know, he talked about it a lot. And the police were just like, uh. (laughs) That sounds too gay for me. So Versace's name literally didn't appear in the FBI files at all before he died, before he died. The FBI made a flyer with Andrew's face on it and 3000 copies were supposed to be made and distributed in the Miami area, but they weren't. The cops claim that they were passed out, but realistically there was only one flyer up and it was like in the FBI station, which is like, yeah, cause that's where I go to. Yeah. That's very helpful. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> and even though the police said that they were handed out, like everybody, all the local police in the bars, everybody was like, no, I never heard this. So Andrew literally was able to hide in plain sight for two months. And even though they were supposedly looking for the red truck, it was parked right outside of the hotel that he was staying at. They just didn't find it. I don't know what the fuck they were doing to find it. On Friday, July 11th, Andrew went to a pawn shop and he pawned a stolen item using his real name with his real ID despite knowing that police routinely reviewed pawn shop records. Narcissism. Seriously. I think this was intentional too. him leaving, leaving more breadcrumbs. And also I believe that the item that he pawned was like a rare gold coin that that belonged to Lee Miglin. So the pawn shop owner recognized his name and faxed over the information to the police department. But the detective who was in charge of that took three days off work. Oh my God. So remember this was July 11th. On Sunday, July 13th, Andrew retreated to his hotel where the reception clerk told him your rent is due today. He told her he was tired and asked if he could pay in the morning to avoid having to go back up to his room and then coming back out. And she told him that was fine since he had been staying there for like two months already. She didn't really think anything of it. That evening around 9 p.m., he slipped back out and he went and got himself a sub sandwich and somebody actually recognized him and called the police. By this point, Andrew was on America's Most Wanted. So he called the police and they were like, can you describe him? And he was like, "Uh, yeah, he's the guy on America's Most Wanted, the gay guy who killed his lover and like three other people. And they apparently had no idea who he was talking about. What? Yeah. Nonetheless, police showed up within minutes. But by then, Andrew was gone. Andrew was sighted that same evening at a dance club called Twist, where he danced one dance with a hairdresser named Brad, who he told his name was Andy. On the dance floor, Andrew was all over Brad. When Brad asked him, what do you do for a living? He went, I'm a serial killer. (laughs) Just kidding. I'm an investment (laughs) banker. And then he disappeared into the crowd. The rest of the night, Andrew was trying to act fabulous. He was chatting people up. It was clear that he didn't know anybody. He was dressed nicely, but at the bar, he just ordered water and he bummed a cigarette. He probably didn't have any money. Yep. In the morning, the clerk at the hotel called Andrew at 10 a.m. And Andrew answered the phone and said that he'd be down in 10 minutes to pay the rent. But at about 1030, the clerk realized that Andrew had actually skipped out the back gate. Andrew had also shaved his head before leaving. I don't know what Andrew did or where he stayed on Sunday, but on Monday, he was spotted asking people for a dollar at a pizza place. And then later that night, he was supposedly spotted at another club pretending that he lived in a luxurious building on the beach. (sighs) On Tuesday morning, July 15th, Andrew was up bright and early, and so was Gianni Versace. Oh, no. Versace decided to take a walk to get some magazines from a news cafe just three blocks from his villa and walked back home around 8.40 a.m. Versace walked back up to his iron gate and put his key into the lock. A neighbor glanced back at him, and he calmly smiled at her. Then Andrew rapidly walked up the steps and held out his hand, holding Jeff Trail's gun, and shot Versace at close range. He was hit in the neck right behind his left ear and cheek. The first bullet cracked the base of his brain, fracturing his skull and tearing the upper part of his spinal cord and neck. Oh, God. The bullet flew out of his neck and hit one of the metal railings of the gate before breaking apart. One of the bullet fragments hit a dove, which instantly died and fell on its back in front of the mansion. What a scene. Yeah. And this actually led a lot of people to believe that this was like a like a mob killing. After the first shot, Versace turned his head slightly when he was hit from an even closer range with a second bullet through the right side of his face next to his nose. It lodged in his head and cracked the top of his skull. He immediately slumped to the steps in a pool of blood. His neighbor was still standing there in shock. Andrew calmly walked away. Versace's partner, Antonio D'Amico, heard the shot, so he ran outside. He was the first to find Versace, and he cried, no, no, no. He was waiting for a friend to come hang out with him. His name was Lazaro Quintana. So he got there right as this scene is happening. And he looked at the neighbor and demanded what happened. 
She was speechless and just pointed down the street at Andrew, who was now halfway down the block. So Quintana ran after him, shouting, you bastard. He chased him into an alley when Andrew turned around and pointed a gun at him. So Quintana gave up the chase. A couple of garbage men witnessed the pursuit and told police that they believed they saw him running towards a parking garage. So the cops on patrol checked the garage just after or just before 9 a.m. At 9.12, a pile of sweaty clothes was found on the on the third level of the garage outside the passenger door of a red Chevy pickup. It was a black tank top under a gray T-shirt, a pair of boxer shorts and a black backpack, which was all the things Andrew was wearing. The truck's license plate was from South Carolina, but when they ran a check on it, they found nothing. Apparently, the plates hadn't been reported stolen, which is weird since the police had supposedly been been looking for this truck for weeks. Oh, just another thing to add to the list of things that they're not doing. For real. (laughs) At 917, an officer radioed that he saw someone on the roof wearing a red shirt and glasses. He said he might be part of the parking crew. He just peered over the edge. He's just walking around. Dark skin, Latin male. He looks like security for the building, wearing one of those kinds of shirts. He was going from one corner of the roof to the other, just peering over the edges. But when one of the police officers made it up to the roof about five minutes later, Andrew disappeared. A bloodhound following Andrew's scent went directly to these four corners. So we're confident that this was indeed Andrew. I wonder if he like stole an employee shirt or something or or if he was just like saving this shirt in his backpack or what. Right. And how did he how did he escape so easily when you have to go down? That's crazy. I don't know exactly what he did. Like I don't know how he disappeared either. He's on the roof. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. He must have like jumped down or something. Versace lost consciousness and went brain dead immediately, though his heart was kept beating by paramedics who rushed him to the hospital. No. The police showed up at his house, fumbling all over each other, and they basically turned the home into their command post, which made the staff at the house really uncomfortable. Like Antonio D'Amico, who was Versace's partner, he was devastated and he just wanted to go and be with Gianni. He was told, there's nothing you can do at the hospital. You're much more vital to the investigation. That pisses me off because it's like he's not a legitimate partner. It, It makes me really angry, too. He's not a fucking cop. Like, do your job and let him mourn. Anyway, D'Amico was like, fuck this. And he insisted on going. So the police had no choice but to remove the police tape and move their cars and let him out. Later that morning, the police finally checked the VIN of the red truck and were like, hot damn, that's the truck Kunanen was in. And then they finally realized that Kunanen was indeed Versace's killer. Around 1 p.m. that same day, two police officers walked by a car belonging to, to a Miami FBI agent named Keith Evans. And in the back seat, they saw boxes and boxes filled with flyers showing Andrew Kunanen's face. 3,000 flyers in his back seat for who knows how long. I just, why? Why didn't you put them up? On Wednesday, July 16th, the pawn shop owner who had faxed the police when Andrew came in to pawn something, she called the police to follow up. Remember, the detective who was in charge of that had taken three days off and he got back the same day that Versace was shot. So now again, Miami PD is like, How embarrassing for us. They had no leads for Andrew at this point, except maybe one. There was a guy who owned a sailboat and he found that his boat had been broken into. And in it, he found old pita bread and newspapers opened up to stories about the Versace killing. And then he saw a man who looked like Andrew sitting on a bench across the street, reading a navigational book that he realized was his own navigational book that was stolen from his boat. That's so creepy. And he's just sitting like across the street from this boat. Like, I'm just going to go across the street and read this book. I still police checked the boat and they were unable to find any forensic evidence, but they did find a red polo shirt. The FBI followed a lead to a hotel and they were allowed to search rooms only after knocking and announcing who they were. They got to one room where they heard no response. So they busted in and started shooting. It ended up being a family who was sound asleep and were killed in their sleep by the police. Oh, my God. I hope they they put those police in prison. Doubtful, though. Doubtful. And it was all in vain because Andrew was not in the hotel. That's horrible. Can't even go on vacation with your family. Andrew's parents were contacted. Marianne was taken to San Francisco where they hit her in a witness protection program. Pete Kunanen was approached in the Philippines by a politician and a camera crew. Pete completely denied that Andrew was homosexual or remotely capable of killing Versace. He also says that he was unable to mourn his son without a news crew ambushing him. During the investigation, a volunteer counselor named Mike Dudley came forward and said that in February, so like five months earlier, just a couple months before the killing started, Andrew went to this volunteer counselor and told him that he was worried 
that he had contracted the AIDS virus. He described Andrew as nervous, partied out, and said that Andrew had said, if I find out who did this to me, I'm going to get them. Hmm. So some people believe that this might have like sparked everything. Right. Like it's said that maybe this sparked like an anger in gay men in the gay community or towards the gay community. Right. By July 23rd, Andrew was still missing. A guy named Fernando Carrera and his wife went to check on a houseboat that he managed. He looked after a number of houseboat properties and they noticed that one of the locks was stuck or broken and the other lock was unlatched. They went inside and they looked around and he said to his wife, somebody's been here. They found a little bed, like, like just like cushions and blankets on the floor, like a little handmade bed. And a chair was set up kind of like as a barricade. And then they saw two sandals and realized somebody might be in here right now. Oh, that's creepy. Fernando keeps a handgun in his waistband. So he pulled it out to conduct the search. And then a loud shot rang out in the second floor master bedroom. It was really loud. So Fernando thought that somebody had shot at him and missed. So he and his wife ran outside and crouched in some bushes and they watched at the front door. And he said he was too nervous to dial 911. So he called his son and his son, his son called the police. The police arrived within four minutes. They had no idea whether this man in the houseboat was Andrew Cunanan, but they were taking no chances this time. So they closed the traffic off on that street. At 8 p.m., they sprayed pepper and CS gas into the houseboat. And then they went in and at about 9.30 p.m., they found the body that they positively identified to be Andrew Cunanan. His eyes were wide open and he now had a few days worth of beard. He had Jeff Trail's gun in his hand and he appeared to have shot himself in the head. Andrew's autopsy revealed that he did not actually have HIV or AIDS. Oh, my gosh. I mean, not that that would make it any better, but. It just I think it kind of adds to his like he has like this psychosis, you know, like 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 he jumped to a conclusion. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. It's kind of like when you Google your illness, you know, and you see all these symptoms. Maybe he started feeling some symptoms and he like blew them up in his mind or something. Right. After Andrew's death, Pete Cunanan returned to the United States for the first time since 1988. He told a Chicago Tribune correspondent, my son is not like that. He is innocent. He is not a homosexual. He had a Catholic upbringing and was an altar boy. I don't believe he did what the American police say he did. Sure. Pete told the L.A. Times that he was going to find the truth regarding his son's suicide and killing spree. And he was going to make a movie about this. He hoped to make plenty of money with this movie that he would donate to a church, a chapel, or a temple in his son's memory. Sure. Sure. Doubt it. Yeah. (laughs) Pete, at this point, has a new Filipino wife, and he spends his days scheming to find buried treasure that he believes the Japanese left behind in the Philippines during World War II. He is a follower of Claire Prophet, who is a leader of a cult whose followers took to underground survivalist shelters in the hills of Montana to prepare for doomsday which they believed would happen in 1990. And of course, it did not happen. So this cult got smaller and smaller, but it still kind of exists in little subgroups around the country. Hmm. All of Andrew's friends, loved ones, former roommates, his parents, everybody, they were all offered money for pictures of Andrew and further information about him. Pete completely sold out, of course, took as much money as he could. And donated it, right? Straight to charity. Oh, sure. Sure. (laughs) The Trails and the Madsons avoided the media altogether, but they were hardly left alone. Rebecca Reese, who was the wife of the victim, Bill Reese, she went into seclusion after her husband's death. She made one appearance on camera while Andrew was still at large, mostly because she wanted people to know that her husband was not gay. Some of Andrew's friends were outed because of their connections to him. Some were even disinherited because of it. Oh, that's sad. All because their parents found out that they were gay. Not even because of the connection to Kunanan, because they're gay. Right, exactly. Soon after the manhunt ended, the FBI called representatives of a group of gay organizations for a meeting and told them, we need to foster a better relationship because if you're being preyed upon by killers or victimized, we need to help. The case prompted an outpouring in the gay press about the way gay crime is reported. The Versace family continues to insist that Gianni had no connection to Andrew Cunanan and they're angered that he wasn't caught sooner. Prior to his death, Gianni Versace had actually survived a rare ear cancer as well as a bone marrow cancer in his cheek. He became really sick and depressed at one point while on chemotherapy before beating cancer. If not for Andrew Cunanan, he may have gone on to live many more years. That's so sad, as would everyone else have 
if they didn't pass cross paths with him. Yeah, so that's the story of Andrew Cunanan and how he killed Gianni Versace, Bill Reese, Lee Miglin, David Madsen, and Jeff Trails. All right, so thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Remember that you can find episode notes on brokenlimelight.com along with some pictures and videos, things like that. Don't forget, you can also sign up to our Patreon to get early access to our episodes. You get access to the episodes two days early for just $1 a month. And while we're at it, let me tell you about our next episode so maybe it'll motivate you a little. In fact, we're going to have Summer tell you. Our next episode is going to be about... Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby, that's right. The pudding pop man. The pudding pop man. I'm a double, 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 double. That's how he talks. A double, double, double. All right, guys, thank you again for sticking it out with us. We'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs> Bye. I'm and here. I recorded this time. Yay. All right. Wait, that's only four. And Gil, wait, what's his oh. name? And Lee Miglin. Yep, Gil. <laughs> Lee Miglin. I know. I don't know where I got that from. <laughs> Good try, though. <laughs> Gil. And it was like 30 yards of a walk. It was like a 30 yard walk. Sorry, I said that like in Spanish. <laughs> Ouch. I got a boo boo. <laughs> You're so cute. Tomorrow I'm going to kill myself. Better go dancing tonight. Ready? Our next. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Bill Cosby and I like to rape women with my jello pudding pops and doo Oh my god. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> what did your daughter say about him again? She was like, he just sounds like Scooby Doo beatboxing. <laughs> and we looked at her like, this is not even wrong. <laughs> That's weirdly accurate.